let me just take a moment to welcome all of you and just say to you that really for us at CGD, it's, it's an honor really to have all of you here. And uh, it's a partnership that we greatly value. Um, I had the opportunity to, to greet you last year when you were here. And I should say, looking around here, uh, there's quite a few faces that are familiar, not just from that event, but from your being here at many of the other events that we do, because we have an interest and an agenda in common. And uh, I want to say also that you have actually a wonderful agenda today, so I won't take much time between your getting started with it. Um, I, I just want to maybe uh, talk to you about a couple of uh, events that... Uh, we just had or are about to have, which I think speak to particularly to, to the agenda that you have, um, and say that uh, if you haven't, I'm sure most of you already signed up to, to our mailing list, but if you haven't, you know, we're very happy to help you do that because there are things happening here and, and work coming out, which uh, I hope will be of continuing interest to you. And, and the two things I wanted to particularly mention is, uh, the first is uh, a new piece of work we've just come out with, which is called Focusing on Fragility, the Future of, of U.S. Assistance in Fragile States, which actually my colleague uh, uh, Sarah Rose has uh, authored. And it brings together it, it, uh, the results of a, a year-long working group which included uh, a number of, about 20 uh, members, including a number of uh, ex-officials uh, from USAID, maybe some of you uh, in the room, uh, because uh, uh, this topic on which a number of people have been writing, thinking, and we then convened a panel last week, uh, which brought together some of the people, including uh, Michelle Flournoy, who's been involved in this from uh, a slight different angle. Uh, and what I took away from that is that this scenario of work in which we're all still trying to figure out how best to bring the different dimensions of uh, uh, support and engagement in a way that adds up to, to more than the sum of the parts. And actually, some of the examples are where the whole adds up to less than the sum of the parts, because sometimes we find that the uh, whole of government uh, is working in ways that could even be at cross purposes uh, in some cases. So how we got to go beyond that is going to be a, a continuing agenda item. The the second um, uh, piece of work I want or event I want to mentioned to you is one coming up in just a few days on November 6th, when we'll be hosting an event here on, on USAID's uh, efforts to implement what Administrator Green has been calling the, the journey to self-reliance. And uh, on that event, we're going to have a presentation from the head of the Bureau of Policy Planning and Learning uh, here, and then a panel discussion, which will include uh, the head of an implementing organization, uh, mission director from Ethiopia, and an official from the Europe and Eurasia Bureau to try and see from these different angles, what does this actually translate into in practice, this, this approach? So I hope that if some of you have an opportunity uh, to participate in it and come and ask some uh, good questions, that will be uh, uh, greatly appreciated. Final thing I should say is that uh, many of you are aware, and I think I mentioned this last year, that Congress has uh, passed the uh, Build Act uh, to formally establish now the U.S. Uh, International Development uh, Finance Corporation. And uh, I think some of you probably also know that this is an idea that uh, we colleagues here at CGD have been working on for, for a number of years uh, in terms of uh, how that kind of organization would be helpful and, and, and what are the ways in which you can structure it and design it to actually be helpful uh, to, to fulfill the mandate. Um, there's been a um, bit of a delay now in the startup of it because of the appropriations-related delay, but we've started already a U.S. Uh, DFC monitor. Uh, I don't know if... Uh, 
I mean, some of you have probably already seen it. Those that haven't or interested, you know, please do sign up for it. And, and what we hope to do in that is to actually keep providing commentary and analysis, especially in the early stages when um, the, the, the DFC is being uh, stood up and the rules and, and procedures are being uh, defined. And, and we want to make sure that uh, the strong mandate it actually translates into development impact. And, and in that, we'll be looking also for close coordination and collaboration between that body and USAID, particularly because the new DFC wants to build a pipeline of good projects in the lower middle income countries. And, and that's where it's very hard to see how they'll be able to, to do that without the kind of uh, engagement which, uh, that you have. Uh, I was saying to uh, Alex and Chris earlier today, uh, when I was thanking them for their very generous annual contribution to CGD, uh, which we appreciate and we are deeply grateful for, that uh, the community of uh, people who do share that same common agenda and common perspective in terms of how uh, we can support development, how the United States can play a constructive and uh, leading role in supporting development is one that sometimes feels uh, more and more like a, a smaller voice, uh, but, but within that voice there are some strong uh, analytics and strong reasons, and, and this kind of gathering is really one way in which we can not just recall but inform the conversations and the discussions going forward. So for us, it's really a, a deep, deep uh, uh, honor and a personal pleasure to have you here. And we hope this is a tradition that we can maintain for many, many years to come. Thank you. Masu, well, thanks again for uh, being here with us today. And, <clears throat> excuse me, welcome to all. And we're delighted that you're here. And that includes a number of specially invited guests, including young professionals from USAID who will join us for much of the day. The AGM is a business meeting, so we'd like to take a few minutes to report back to our members. But before doing that, we want to remind you, all of you, that the success of the UAA depends upon active involvement and work of its members. We have one part-time administrative assistant, Ven Suresh, who does a fantastic job managing communications and records. <clears throat> Very, <clears throat> then. <clears throat> but the volunteer board members and committee members do the rest of the work of the UAA. As always, we need more people to become actively involved, especially from the next generation of USAID retirees. And we're out there trying to recruit them almost as soon as they turn in their papers. Jim Beaver in particular is is scarfing these folks up from uh, from FSI as soon as they come out of uh, come out of USAID. So it's been great, but we still want people to consider stepping up to help build a sustainable USAID alumni association. That will continue to be a major focus of the executive committee over the coming year. So you'll be hearing more from us about it during the year. Now. As many of you must know by now, during the past week, a number of folks in the community of retired USAID officers have been working on and signed a letter of support of our State Department colleagues who have testified in recent investigations on assistance to Ukraine. The response, as of last night, is well over 300 signatures from across the country. And we have people, um, um, former retirees who are, or retirees, um, who are, as we speak, um, seeking to place this, uh, this letter in newspapers in other parts of the country and not just here in Washington, D.C. Although the letter was written and signed by many of us in the UAA, it's not officially from the organization itself. Now, We'll highlight some of the accomplishments over the past year presented by board co-chair, Nancy Tumovic. Nancy? Good morning, everyone. I'm glad to see we have such a nice 
turnout. Um, as my three-year-old granddaughter Rachel would say, Grandma, mindful, two deep breaths. <laughs> she just started Montessori school. Okay, um, these will be brief comments. The links to our progress report for 2019, as well as our plan, draft strategic plan going ahead, are both posted on our website, and we provided links to them in the email that went out about the AGM. So what you miss here, you'll find there, and we would appreciate you commenting on the strategic plan goals, because that will shape what we do over the next year or two, and it's important that we get your input. Okay, we've had a wonderful success, we think, this year, and we hope you agree with us in some new initiatives, and a lot of the new initiatives, frankly, have resulted from intake of new blood into the executive committee. New co-chairs on a couple of the committees, um, and a lot of enthusiasm. Strengthening USAID Committee uh, continues to work with USAID and pairing, especially in the mentoring program, um, in pairing the mid-level foreign service officers with our UAA retirees. And based on that success, it's like 150 pairs over the course of the eight cohorts. And uh, thanks to both uh, Roberta Mahoney and to Rose Ragas uh, for all the work that they have done on this. Not only have we been successful, but AID has now asked us to elevate our training program mentoring to include uh, new deputy mission directors and mission directors and AID reps. So we're working through the Foreign Service Institute uh, to make this happen. In addition, um, Terry Myers has taken tremendous initiative in, with USAID on a couple of endeavors. One of them is assistance to PPL Bureau in looking through evaluations that USAID has completed, cross-sectoral, individual sectors, and to help capture some of the, the lessons we've learned, some of the experience something that we've found through our discussions, there's simply not enough staff in USAID to do. So we're hoping to pair some um, UAA volunteers with some graduate students so that it becomes a learning process for, for all of us. The other initiative that Terry has taken is an excellent proposal. Um, we'll see if we can post it. I don't think we've done that yet on the website. And that is for uh, establishing internships, increasing the number of internships. Through the analysis, research, conversations that Terry conducted, we found that the State Department, if you count up summer internships, short term, longer term, they annually have something like 1,500 interns. Aid, let me see if I've got this number right, has fewer than 100. So we would like to be working with the missions as well as here with the bureaus in Washington to see if we can gin up more enthusiasm for increasing interns because that is oftentimes one of the sources to take in new foreign service people. Development Issues Committee. Um, all of us know well the uh, exceptional presentations and discussions that are sponsored by the Development Issues Committee. Uh, two primary sessions that are held, uh, the almost monthly uh, session at DECOR um, that uh, Alex Shackow organizes. And you can, again, check through the progress report to see the, the, the litany of speakers who have been very well received. The other is sponsored by the Development Issues Committee itself, and those are sessions that are now, thanks to Arizona State University, uh, being held at their 
office building here in downtown D.C. And these are every six weeks, two months. If you follow our um, regular newsletter and our website, you can find out exactly when those are happening. And, of course, the book club under Sue Callison's um, enthusiastic leadership and having attended a session myself, I've discovered it's really the Economist Book Club. So, <laughs> but non-economists are welcome, I'm told. <laughs> Membership committee, of course, continues to bring in new members. Mention was made of Jim Beaver and his efforts with Betty Cook. Uh, who attend the sessions, uh, retirement sessions at the Foreign Service Institute. And we have, um, you get faxed, handwritten pages with all the names and email addresses of those in attendance, and we follow up with them. And we're, we're getting increasing um, intake through that, which is very useful. But the membership committee co-chairs co -chairs Carol Dabbs and Betty Cook uh, do a tremendous amount. This is the committee that compiles the, the newsletter each month, organizes all the UAA social activities, and of course all logistics for this event, and conducts the various membership surveys. Um, oh, heads up, I was told, heads up, our Winterfest, which is our next social event, takes place on Sunday, February 9th. Frank, if I got that right? Anyway, once again, <laughs> once again, um, Frank Almaguer and Antoinette have agreed to host this at their home in Vienna. So please watch for the announcement of the specifics on that. The other announcement is that um, Tom Nicastro has stepped up from being just a member of the membership committee to being co-chair of the membership committee this coming year. We're very pleased with that. Thank you, Tom. Oh, membership service. I'd like to call your attention at this point to a brand new membership service that is thanks to Alex Shackow and Carol Peasley's initiative. Um, as many of us begin to move to smaller living quarters, uh, or just to reduce clutter? Sound familiar? Uh, the question arises as to the disposition of our personal documents, materials, photos, and memorabilia that we've all acquired over time. And we now can offer you, this has just happened, an option. In collaboration with the USAID Alumni Association, the American University Archives are now offering a repository to our alumni. The AU Library is a very impressive archival program and several years ago created for the Peace Corps community archives which they collect, preserve, and make available to public as well as to continued access by those of us who contribute. Uh, we have provided a handout today in that regard, so it's up to you individually to get into your cellars, garages, libraries, wherever. Okay, and new leadership again this year. Um, Co-chair Jim Beaver and Beth Hogan of the Public Outreach Committee has continued to li liaise with uh, USAID itself, enhanced, especially since Jim came out of the Legislative and Public Affairs Bureau, uh, for uh, seeking opportunities for alumni to, to speak across, across the country. This is work that... Uh, follows up after years of uh, Ann Van Dusen's engagement originally and more recently um, Tish Butler and John Champagne. So we got some new life into the program. The last of our five operating committees is Finance Administration, which performs all of those essential but sort of hidden functions of an organization. Um, tax submissions, managing finances, bank accounts, contracting, insurance, um, and of course, very importantly, our website curating 
and monitoring our office email. So it is with some regret that, and I think we posted this in our newsletter, we are seeing departure of two stalwarts who have each been engaged in this for almost 10 years. And that is, let's see, what are their names? <laughs> oh, David Cohen and George Hill. Are you in the room? Would you like to stand, please? <laughs> and we are delighted that Tish Butler is taking over the website management, Tish. <laughs> and she indicates that, well, David has offered to stay on to make sure that she works into the program. And she figures by, it was 2022. <laughs> so we'll see. And then there are updates uh, from our special uh, committees. The prime mandate of the History Project Committee is the management of the History Project, um, to which we've had tremendous contributions. Uh, while author John Norris originally intended to complete a draft by mid-2019, um, simultaneously he had been recruited by the Gates Foundation, moved to the West Coast. Still writing, we're, I believe, halfway through the script, Alex? Chapter 9 out of 13. Oh, more than, more than. So we can look forward to seeing something coming out, we hope, in the next few months. And oh, as part of our history effort, of course, we give thanks to John Peelmeyer, who has continued to update the bibliography of U.S. State authors and to provide opportunities for authors to present at UAA-sponsored events. The bibliography now includes over 260 titles, and one that struck me particularly, um, there are about 20 new interesting titles, and this one comes from Steve Weiscarver, and it's called, What the Hell Am I Doing Here? <laughs> Check out, the link is on the website. Then, of course, we have the creative efforts of the AGM committee itself. Um, the, under Nancy Peelmeyer and, and Joy Riggs, who's joined this this year, uh, work starts in January to be able to put the program together, uh, to, to make sure that we've got a topic of interest to the community and that we've got speakers who can talk to that particular topic selected. So I think I've covered everything. I may have missed um, Betty Cook as chair of the awards committee, and you will be hearing a lot from Betty today because we have some very important awards to be issued. Yes, sir. Thank you, John. Okay. Um, do we have Tom Carruthers in the room? Okay. So now after that, not so brief, sorry. Uh, now back to Chris for a look, a uh, synopsis of our, our day ahead. Relax and enjoy. <clears throat> Okay, so the first session this year is titled Getting It Right on Democratic Governance, How Do USAID Missions Achieve Results While Navigating Inevitable Landmines? The discussion will zero, zero in on the challenges and opportunities as well as the pitfalls for USAID missions as they design and implement democratic government governance programs. Um, just to emphasize, this is a focus on the experiences of the missions 
um, and the people in those missions and how they deal with the issues that, uh, um, um, that will be discussed here today. Following a coffee break, Peter McPherson, widely respected aid administrator from 1981 to 1987, in conversation with Alex Shackow, will talk about how he confronted some of the difficult challenges of his tenure, lessons learned, and his thoughts about USAID's future. There'll be plenty of time for questions afterwards. Following lunch, we'll have a discussion with Derek Giannino of the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition on why leading globally matters locally in 2020 and beyond. Then we're grateful to have remarks from USAID Deputy Administrator Bonnie Glick. That session will be followed by an announcement of the results of the board elections to fill three vacancies this cycle and the alumni awards to recognize outstanding contributions by selected alumni members. So the day should be filled with stimulating presentations and exchange, not to mention ample opportunity for alumni to socialize over coffee and lunch. Now I'd like to ask our participants on the first panel to come forward. And I'm already here, so uh, I don't need to uh, go very far, okay. Um, I have it, yeah. Um, so, um, Jim Michael will take it from here to introduce our discussion leader, Thomas Carruthers, the Senior Vice President of Carnegie Endowment. And as most of you know, Jim has been the chair of the Development Assistance Committee at the OECD in Paris and was U.S. Ambassador to Guatemala. He's been an Assistant Administrator, Counselor, and Acting Administrator in USAID and previously held senior positions in the State Department. Jim? How are we going to do this? Thank you very much. Uh, thanks to you and the Minister for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to introduce this next item on today's program. Uh, this is where I got into the development. Where, you can't hear me? Is it not working? Is mine working? Yeah. Is this not working? Not from the left. <coughs> There it is. Okay. Hi. Right. I'll start over and say thanks to Chris and Nancy for giving me the opportunity to introduce this next item on the program. Uh, we know that effective and accountable governance and respect for human rights and the rule of law are all important for the development of stable and just and prosperous societies. That was debatable once upon a time. Not so much anymore. We all recognize this and we also recognize that these aspects of development are very complex. And like other donors, USAID has sometimes struggled with the multiple challenges of stimulating commitment, trying to help build local capacities, and at the same time maintain coherence with other parts of our own government and coordinate with the international community. There are lots of landmines. Uh, so this morning we have a terrific panel to discuss these issues. And uh, in my early experience in working with governance issues, uh, I obviously made some mistakes because I was learning by doing. But one thing I got right was to bring in a young State Department lawyer uh, to join in USAID LAC's uh, nascent office on democratic initiatives. And Thomas Carruthers, uh, who will moderate today's panel, has gone on to a distinguished career as an internationally respected thought leader in the field of democratic governance. And he's joined uh, by three outstanding USAID practitioners with broad and varied experiences in managing the challenges of this work and in, the, in the field and in Washington. Chris Crowley, Beth Hogan, and Susan Reichley represent the best in USAID's efforts to give practical effect to the aspiration expressed by John Kennedy so long ago when he said uh, that our foreign assistance program should demonstrate that economic growth and political democracy can develop hand in hand. So many of you will recognize the challenges and opportunities that will be discussed from your own experience and the program leaves time for you to engage with the panel and contribute your own thinking. So, Welcome to the panel. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
I need to organize this thing there. Great. I need to get some stuff here. So. We should go from the outside in. I think so. Let the ladies go first. Good morning, everyone. I'm Tom Carruthers. Thank you, Jim, uh, for that very nice introduction. Uh, when you have Jim Michael as your first boss in the government, it's kind of all downhill after that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I still find myself. <clears throat> trying to do things as a manager that I learned, uh, learned from Jim. <clears throat> the democratic governance work at USAID really got its start in the mid-1980s in the Latin America Bureau, moved quickly to the Asia Bureau later that decade, and then in 1989 on to Central and Eastern Europe, former Soviet Union, Sub-Saharan Africa. And in the early 1990s, DG work, as came to be known, or DRG work, became one of the four core pillars of USAID's work around the world and has remained one of those ever since. And in the ensuing more than 25 years since that became a core pillar, uh, USAID has carried out democracy <coughs> programming all over the world in every region and probably close to 100 countries. USAID is the largest provider of such assistance in the world and has been both a thought leader and an action leader in this field for many, many years. Probably if you added up the spending, you know how hard it is to get the numbers nailed down. But at this point, <clears throat> the US government has probably invested in the neighborhood of 40 or $50 billion in this area over the last 30 years or so. It starts to add up to real money over time. <clears throat> now, although it's well established, <laughs> There remains a lot of debate and discussion about democratic governance work. There's debate and discussion about how best to do it, but there's also debate and discussion about still whether we should do it, how we should do it, how it fits into US foreign policy more generally, how it fits in our relationships with host governments, how it should be monitored and evaluated, and uh, this is a difficult moment for democracy in the world, and how should it fit into the US profile in the world going forward in a world where democracy seems to be so much in question in many parts of the world these days? So there's a lot to talk about. We couldn't have a better group than uh, the three panelists here. I was counting up collectively. They represent 101 <laughs> years of experience at USA. Thank you. <laughs> They're all under 100 individually. Uh, but. Uh, it adds up. <laughs> Chris, Chris Crowley's, uh, I think, unwritten memoir is, is from, from Vietnam to the Arab Spring at the front lines of US assistance in the world. Uh, so it's uh, 41 years at USAID and a very distinguished career spanning many different regions, not just Middle East, for which he's well known his work, but Asia, former Soviet Union, and other parts of the world as well. Uh, Beth Hogan. Uh, only 35 years or so of experience, but it goes by quickly. Uh, a lot of work in Latin America, but other parts of the world as well, Asia. And <clears throat> Susan Reikley, known to many of you as well, uh, about 25 years, I guess, Susan. So uh, <clears throat> um, distinguished work in Russia, but also in policy planning here in Washington and on many other uh, <clears throat> positions and, and activities. All of them combine a tremendous amount of field experience with experience in, in Washington. So they have a, an excellent perspective on these issues, having been both uh, at the front lines there in the field, but also at the bureaucratic front lines here in Washington. And we were saying before in preparing for this panel that unlike a lot of events these days in Washington and elsewhere, this is not being live streamed. Uh, I hope not being tweeted about as we speak. And we'd like to have a, you know, a frank discussion among ourselves with you and really talk turkey about issues that are, that are difficult and, and need to be really uh, talked about in a, in a frank and, and open way. I think there are different perspectives uh, among the panelists based on their own particular experiences, both the regions they worked in and the roles they played. 
Uh, and I bet there are a lot of different experiences and perspectives here. I can see them. So I know there are among a lot of you as well. And I hope we'll have a chance to bring out as many, as many of those as possible. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start <clears throat> engaging them in a discussion. We're going to go through four or five questions that I'm going to ask them, and we're going to talk. Uh, but we're going to leave plenty of time to bring all of you into the discussion. So let's start there. I want to get right into the heart of things. The <clears throat> first question I want to ask the panelists to talk a little bit about is DG work is, is often sensitive. Of course, any work where you know, the United States or another country goes to another country and says, we're here to help can be sensitive, whether it's health work or education work or whatever. But DG work obviously has particular sensitivities. This is political work <clears throat> in a field which was not designed to be political. Um, so let's talk about those sensitivities. Uh, it's not that it's bad that it has sensitivity, sensitivities, but it's a fact. It's a fact that needs to be dealt with when we think about how such work is done. Maybe Susan, why don't we, uh, oh. Chris suggested we start out at that end. Okay, yeah. I didn't He's know that, but it's great to be back and it's yeah. great to see everybody and, <laughs> and to be here. And I was thrilled to, you know, particularly participate in this discussion and I really look forward to it being a discussion. And it's funny to be alumni, I mean, I, I graduated, I guess, two years ago from the USAID University and, and uh, used to come and talk to this group. But I always, in the last two years, I just tried to always come and pop in and obviously keeping in touch with the board. And I just value this group so much. Um, I valued it when I was in the agency, uh, but I really value it so much now that I'm an alumni. And I just wanted to start off first by um, telling one story that will lead, I think, into the sensitivities. And, and uh, you know, some of you in this room know this story because you helped, helped uh, really mentor me in, uh, through the agency and through a time of transition for democracy, rights, and governance. And um, as many of you know, I joined the agency actually as a, a PDO. PDO, and that was my passion project design, and going out to um, some of the first countries in Latin America. I was fortunate to be in the Latin America Bureau under Ambassador Michael at the time, and, and to come of age also at the time of the fall of the Soviet Union. And as I was going out and designing programs, uh, you know, whether that was in Haiti during uh, the uh, the military dictatorship of General Cedrus and hoping to plan for uh, the transition and, and uh, Jim and Neil Levine and others, uh, David Cohen obviously who was our mission director at the time, uh, designing the first rule of law program as a young uh, foreign service officer and just pa passionate about this work. But we weren't really a field even though as Tom said, you know, in the mid 80s, obviously, is, is a time when the DRG sector started to be born. I, and just to tell this one story, as I was, you know, coming back from these, designing these programs and seeing how critical they were to achieving our other development objectives, even in some of the toughest uh, situations, and uh, feeling like, boy, this, we need to invest more as an agency, sort of being a newcomer to the agency, saying, you know, this field of democracy, and actually we didn't say rights, we said democracy and governance, right? Um, and thanks to Neil and many people in the room really adding the rights piece. And um, my supervisor at the time, a wonderful supervisor, said, no, you don't want to do that. You don't want to really go in that direction of DRG. First of all, it's not a real field. It's not a real development sector. And if you want to be mission director someday, you need to uh, really stick with PDO, go the program route. You'll be the right arm of the front. And I'm sitting there as a young officer thinking, a mission director? I'll never be a mission director. I just want to get some good experience and, and whatnot. And I just think that um, you know, from the start, I, I learned that it, it was a bit of a unique sector in development in general, um, definitely within USAID, and, and I saw that change during uh, my 25 years, and, and then going off to uh, Nicaragua in really for our first uh, democracy office in, in Nicaragua, uh, preparing uh, for the elections for the first democratic transition to uh, democratically elected leader uh, was, was also a challenge. But I guess the sensitivities, I. I take with me whether it was in Haiti, Nicaragua, Russia, Colombia, a little different than obviously working globally is it, it really did depend upon obviously where you were in the world and I think that's something we're going to really dig into in this panel of um, the importance first of all of, of the local context but also the political context and not just here in Washington but obviously um, globally and, and how we confronted that whether that was in Latin America where obviously uh, the United States played a, 
a key role uh, in many of these countries in, in a way that was not always um, the most effective for us trying to do democracy rights and governance, or to Russia, where Carol Peasley was my mission director when we were doing things at a, uh, building on a lot of the momentum from the 90s into the 2000s, but working in the former Soviet Union, I'm sure Chris will talk about this as well, very different context when you're doing democracy rights and governance work uh, with a, a former superpower, uh, to then going into um, different contexts and as we grew the field of DRG and did uh, in the policy bureau with the, the whole agency and, and many outside stakeholders, the DRG strategy, which I'm glad to see is still um, cited today. So there are a lot of lessons learned. Um, I do think it's a unique sector. I'm still, even though, uh, you know, gone doing different things uh, now, I think it's absolutely fundamental to uh, to achieving the development objectives and ultimately our foreign policy. Susan, let me ask you a follow-up question. You know, these days, it's, uh, it's almost hard to imagine that the United States was in Russia cooperatively with the Russian <laughs> government promoting democracy. Can I call Carol up here? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's uh, times of You did change. a great job. Yeah. It, yeah, that's what I say. I'm like, look at my track record, Haiti, yeah. Nicaragua, Russia. <laughs> I was I was getting to that. But, uh, <laughs> Thank yeah. you, Tom. But what what were some of the things that you did, or how did this work? How did you do it differently to take account of those sensitivities? Or what? Mm. Let's talk a little bit more. What do we mean by sensitivities? With whom? About what? Yeah. Yeah. So I think the sensitivities of recognizing in that context, absolutely, that they not only are a former superpower, but um, the intellectual capability and capacity. And, and we talk about partnership, and obviously we talk a lot about partnership uh, today and local systems. But in that context, being very sensitive to, to uh, you know, not only where they were, but where they were going. And, and I'll be. In, so I love how this is off the record, uh, uh, because after that four years in, in Russia, uh, went to the National Defense University and spent a year, and I, and I think many of us, you know, after we go through intense assignments, you need a year to reflect or write. And I was fortunate to go there as a student, and, um, and I just had to get it out of my system, and it ended up signing up to write a long paper called Lessons Learned in Democracy Building in the Former Soviet Union. And I think there were a lot of lessons, at least, that I learned. And John Teft was the um, senior advisor at the time. So we're sitting in the Kennan room at NDU, reading old cables from the 90s, all those old reports. Bill Hammack was there <laughs> with him before me. And I think a lot of reflection, at least for me, yeah. of what we didn't do right and what I didn't do right, and maybe not being as sensitive to um, to the where they were going and how we were perceived. Um, and I remember in that paper and sitting with John Teff and saying, you know, we just should have been more sensitive to as we were moving so fast and we thought they were moving with us along the way, they were bristling underneath. And not obviously a lot of our partners and reformers, but clearly the, the host country government officials we were dealing with and, and being there from Yeltsin to Putin, which was which was a tremendous shift um, in, mm -hmm. in our stakeholders um, or our, our counterparts in certain sectors. Mm -hmm. And um, that I wish I would have been probably more sensitive to, uh, but I, I felt like I was building on the wave of what we saw in the 90s, and we were planning our, our strategy. We uh, was really a graduation strategy that we had been planning in order to you know, transition out of there, and a lot of things mm -hmm. changed that, obviously. Good. Beth, let's turn to you and uh, different regional perspectives and experiences. When I say sensitivities, what do you think of and what specific examples like that that you, you might be able to bring in on that point? Sure. Um, well, my experience in the sector started in, um, well, for just a, one year in um, Jamaica, but then uh, five years in Guatemala. Terry Brown was my first mission director. And uh, then um, at that time, we had um, the peace accords were being negotiated. And so that framework basically became the design of our democracy program. And so while it was uh, a difficult lift, they were basically required to do some of these things, like 
supporting civil society, reforming their justice system, et cetera. Um, so, it, you know, we kind of had the wind at our back a little bit because we had that political commitment to reform. And then I went to South Africa, and this was during the first, um, this was during the first and only um, Mandela administration. And so, therefore, it was the first fully democratically elected government. And again, it was an ideal situation in that you had um, a government that was completely committed to reform. And I mean, from the basic reforms of going into a courtroom and having to break down the whites, the coloreds, and the black mm -hmm. section, you know, to make it an open courtroom for everyone, um, to more sophisticated things like support of the Human Rights Commission, etc. Um, but again, we were one step behind. They were fully, you know, um, on board, and it was a, a great experience. Um, Latin America uh, was a little bit different later when I came back um, to LAC. One of the things that um, we were doing under the Obama administration was standing with civil society because we saw a turn in many Latin American countries that were becoming more closed, more repressive, uh, clamping down on uh, freedom of expression, freedom of association, et cetera. And so we were uh, at a point where we were negotiating the framework agreement with Ecuador. This was back in 2013, 2014. And Ecuador at the time was led by President Rafael Correa, and he was quite repressive towards um, NGOs in particular, and he was you know, chopping down on their, on their rights. Um, and we had a major program to support civil society there, particularly the indigenous um, and their rights to their land in the Amazon and to protect it and to develop economically. Um, we um, went to renegotiate the framework agreement with the um, then um, foreign minister, and they said, yeah, but we can't, you can't do civil society work here. Um, we said, well, this isn't a menu where you get to pick and choose. You, you know, this, is, this is our strategy, and this is what we, we consider to be an important part of our foreign policy. Didn't have a lot of support from State Department, frankly, um, off the record on that because they didn't want to lose assistance. But we said, no, you know, our president is firm about standing with civil society. We're not going to walk away from these partners. They're doing important work. And they stalled and stalled until we had a, we, we had a framework that elapsed and we ended up closing the mission over this. Mm -hmm. And it was a very controversial move. Um, we did not have full support from the country team about this uh, on this subject. Um, we had an FSN, uh, for example, who was the person who um, managed our program that we kept on board because we were going to continue supporting these NGOs, but from Washington instead. Uh, this um, FSN, we were going to move to the embassy, and um, the ambassador said, no, she can't sit here. Um, and we fought this right to, you know, in Washington through the interagency, and they said, no, we don't want to see those, um, and those um, partners of yours coming in and out of the embassy after you've been told to shut that down. So we really had to stand off with, with state about whether you're on board with the president's policy or not. And uh, they assured us that they were, but they wouldn't host our FSN. So uh, that was politically sensitive within the yeah. interagency, for sure. Um, fast forward. Um, I also, when I was the acting head of the Latin American Caribbean Bureau for my last three years um, in um, the agency, we also had um, non-presence countries, Cuba and Venezuela. Cuba <laughs> was a nightmare, frankly, because you had such strong and passionate feelings in Congress about whether we should be there or not. And interestingly enough, it didn't break down by party line. It broke down, uh, you know, as you can imagine, for Cuban Americans like Rubio and Diaz Balart at the time and Ross Layton, and they were very strongly and Senator Menendez in, in support of what we were doing in Cuba. And then you had Leahy and others who thought uh, that we were undermining um, the <coughs> administration and we shouldn't be we shouldn't be doing this. So. Um, it was, it, it, you can't win on something like Cuba because you can't, I mean, it's just mm -hmm. so politically hot here in the United mm -hmm. States in terms of what mm -hmm. our approach should be to these non-presence countries. However, <laughs> in Venezuela, we were supporting um, electoral reforms and we were supporting um, the elections themselves, which led to the first um, uh, legislatively um, open elections whereby the opposition party won. Um, and so we um, were able to at least get some footing there. But of course, we've seen what's happened in Venezuela since. And so it's, it certainly hasn't been the success that we had hoped it would be. But um, yeah, so, so those are those, yeah, those, are those sensitivities. Yeah, They're both, right. as I say, with um, the governments themselves in the field, but they're also within our own interagency. Yeah. We'll come back to the interagency. 
Uh, thank you, Beth. Mm -hmm. Chris, you have particularly the perspective you were, I think, Deputy Assistant Administrator in the Middle East Bureau in the, the time of the Arab Spring, uh, an extremely important time both for the region and for U.S. policy, and this issue of you know, work on DG, you know, surfaced and, and was was an important part of the mix and a complex one. Tell us a little bit about the sensitivities there. Well, the sensitivities in <clears throat> in the Middle East and certainly in Egypt um, um, were a little different, not only, sorry, from different countries uh, in the Middle East to Egypt. And Egypt, I think, was sort of the the centerpiece of, of what was going on. Um, after, of course, the, um, the event in Tunisia in which the gentleman um, committed suicide by, by burning himself um, alive. In Egypt, um, there had always been a great deal of sensitivity towards doing anything uh, related to democracy and governance. Um, I recall the first project I ever saw in this area came up for signature when I was the deputy director in Egypt in 1993, and it was Administration of Justice Program, and I think it had been um, the first project, um, at least in Egypt, um, or anywhere else in the Middle East for that matter. I wasn't sure what was going on elsewhere at the time. But um, the great Hank Bassford was the mission director at that time. I was his deputy. He was on home leave, and I had been on leave before, so I wasn't tracking the development of um, uh, particular projects uh, for quite some time. And on my desk shows up this project for supporting judge, judges in in, um, in Cairo by putting computers in their homes so that they can uh, look at their cases online. And I said, you know, what the hell is this? And that was my sort of my first reaction <laughs> to a democracy and governance program in the Middle East. And I called up Hank, who was on home leave, and I said, Hank, you want me to sign this thing? Um, and I, frankly, I don't think it's a very good idea. Um, and I listed some reasons. But nevertheless, that sort of set off, um, I think, programming in Egypt. And so um, in the following years when I, wa when I wasn't there, I'm pretty sure the, the Egyptian attitude toward um, um, us getting involved and stirring up trouble, as it were, um, um, was not appreciated. And By the Egyptian government. By the Egyptian or government. Egyptian and that was even more in evidence um, during the period of the, um, um, uh, the Arab Spring. Um, and in Washington, too, there was a great debate um, about how this should be supported and what was what was the appropriate kinds of activity that we should be undertaking? Because there were a lot of people in the streets and there were a lot of nascent civil society organizations that were trying to become active um, as this revolution was taking place. Um, when Mubarak was forced out of power, um, certainly um, at the behest of our president, um, in a telephone call, you know, you better leave now, um, and he did. Um, and the government, the, the interim government called the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces was formed. That organization was then in charge of, of um, basically overseeing what we all were doing in terms of, of development policy and D&G programming. And I can only say, and Jim Beaver was there as well, um, I can only say that um, the attitude was, um, um, was not good, um, particularly since one of the decisions we had made in Washington in moving forward was to provide grants directly to some of these civil society organizations, uh, not even using an interim, um, using interim um, grantees to provide those grants. Um, but doing so in a way which would support these groups that were out there organizing um, to continue the so-called Arab Spring forward. This was a critical decision that was made, I think, in Washington, D.C. at the time. Um, and it was not one which was appreciated by the government. Um, and the government was vindictive subsequently and made it very difficult for USAID programming in Egypt 
um, even when we wanted to undertake programs related to economic growth or other things, health, um, population. So there was a period where, um, where we experienced an extreme backlash uh, in Egypt, and it resulted in an evacuation of a, a number of our personnel to Washington, D.C. So it's very, it was very um, um, clear, the message that we were getting from the Egyptian government, and I think mm -hmm. it's one, and I've been away from it for six years now, I think it's one that has continued um, um, even as we speak. Mm -hmm. um, it was different in other parts of the world in which I served, mm -hmm. but that's what I yeah. was dealing with at that time. Mm -hmm. um, the Syria situation also started to emerge at that time um, with USAID's efforts and the State Department's efforts to, um, um, to implement some programs with groups uh, private groups, both in the northern part of Syria and in the southern part of Syria, um, and to support the so-called Syrian Democratic Forces, um, both economically and with, and this is a controversial um, um, issue, um, with some kinds of other non-lethal military equipment, which in fact really didn't meet the needs of the people who were doing what they were doing in northern Syria. Um, just as I was leaving, or just after I had left my assignment in, uh, in Washington, um, the U.S. military, and there was an election, and the Muslim Brotherhood took over um, in 2012, um, but there was a coup d'etat, and um, uh, the military took over, um, and the situation exists today um, as it was then. Um, so. The main country in the Middle East right now um, is not very acceptive of this kind of programming. I don't know exactly what hoops have to be gone through in order to work with civil society groups, but there was a notorious Law 32 in existence back in the 1990s, which required every single organization to be registered. Um, and it's very difficult for local organizations to get that kind of registration. So Egypt, um, I'd have to say, um, when we look at it, it was a failure, but it was a failure for some complex regions, uh, reasons, mm. which probably included decisions that were made back in Washington, D.C. about mm. how we would approach the program. Well, let's turn the, to the part of, thank you, all three of you, part of talking about sensitivities is, you know, on certain er in certain areas like health and education, USAID's place within a country team in a country or here in Washington is relatively clear. But on democracy and governance issues, USAID has a, a different kind of place in the interagency process. There's the State Department with a significant role. There's the White House, the NSC, often uh, with, its, with its role as well. And so USAID plays, uh, has a different place as a partner, and that leads. And then Congress as well on issues like Cuba, as you say, have much more direct interest. So USAID, which is used to a certain kind of approach to the interagency process in its DNA as a development organization finds in democracy and governance work that it's, it's at, a, at a different table often with a different role. T tell me a little bit about pressures with the State Department or Congress or in some cases grantees who have different connections in Washington and are not the same kind of implementing partners that US had, USAID has. Can you think of one or, two, you know, one or two cases about that. Uh, why don't we turn to you, Beth, and we'll come to Susan. Sure. Um, the first project paper I ever worked on in Guatemala was a justice reform program. And one of the things that um, we had uh, in there was the inalienable right to due process. And this is sort of hanging our hat on that. And we sent it around the country team for comments, and I got back something written in the margin that said, narcs don't care about due process. We care about convictions. <laughs> So that's where we were starting. <laughs> I forgot to mention the I forgot to mention the Justice Department. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah. I didn't say which uh, agency said that, but you could yeah. probably figure it out. So yeah, we did. We um, you know we were at a different 
end of that um, table in terms of what we were trying to do there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and it was, it, it made for a difficult working relationship. But um, I think over time, you know, we prevailed and I think we, they came around to see the value of what we were doing um, and the importance of what we were doing. But it also comes down to who's at the table, you know, a lot of times. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have these normal kind of tensions between agencies um, in terms of who who does what. I remember um, the Justice Department felt that they should have the right of first refusal for any program that was in the democ democracy sector, anything in the justice sector that dealt with um, mm. judicial operators, mm -hmm. because that yeah. those were their colleagues. They weren't ours. They were their colleagues. And so we you know, had to politely um, mm. You know, refuse to uh, allow that kind of dominance over our um, uh, our democracy programs, but or our justice sector programs. But um, it didn't go away um, when we were designing the ramp up of assistance in Central America, for example. Again. Justice stepped forward and they said that USAID couldn't handle this. This was going to, they needed to be the lead agency. Mm -hmm. And we decided we're going to take this outside. And by outside, we <laughs> meant let's take it to the field. And we had Justice, myself, for USAID and State Department at very high levels. Tom Shannon was, uh, was the State Department guy. And we went and visited each of these countries and we showed, you know, what USAID was doing there, um, how they worked in coordination with Justice, but they had different roles. And, you know, they, they came away convinced that that um, we did know what we were doing, and these were our partners as much as they were partners um, for uh, prosecutors, for example, from the Justice Department. And so we got their buy-in, but um, it's, it's never one and done. It's something in my experience that we have to keep Mm -hmm. at, you know, mm -hmm. with every new program with in, every, in any new country, mm -hmm. specific, and especially because of the change of personnel around mm -hmm. the country team, and yeah. that, you yeah. know, that, that's something that Susan, I'd be curious to hear your perspective, and it makes me, you know, a deeper question one could ask is, <laughs> has, by doing DG work or DRG work, has USAID increased its heft in the interagency process, or has it never been able to change its relationship to the other actors in a way that, that it would need in order to be, in some cases, as effective as it could be on DG? I, I think it really increased its heft. I mean, in, in thinking back in the early days, and that was a great example Beth just gave. I mean, we were the new kids, if you will, on the block in the in this mm -hmm. sector because others, whether it was DOJ or State Department or you know different parts of State Department, from INL to to DRL, felt like they they were the ones who did this. Like aid, you know. So yeah. and what I saw over time. Uh, was exactly as Beth described it, a, you know, a real appreciation and understanding because it comes down to the relationships and the partnerships, and that's what we do. We're all about being outside and working directly with partners, whether they're host country government partners or civil society or just different actors in the space, and, and I think that that value really grew over time. The, it, and I'll give a couple of examples, but what I also think has been you know, really different, and it was great to see, and I was with a, a lot of um, young program officers uh, last night who are all in town. It's the first worldwide program officer conference since 2012. It's hard to believe it's the first time we've done it. And they really do understand their role, I think, in a different way than perhaps I did when I started out of, um, it, you know, you're tied at the hip with the political section, with, you know, different, uh, even, you know, whoever's uh, the head of the mill group section, or, you know, depending upon on the environment. I think today's um, USAID folks are coming in because of they've been they they do have a different role and responsibility and, and mm -hmm. you know the sector has has grown so much. So I think that's a, a very positive thing. I think the the challenge um, I definitely and I'm glad Beth highlighted this. Uh, ironically it is still with the Department of Justice still. Um, it, it's really struck me when I came back and I was uh, the head of the policy bureau and we were obviously working on lots of policies and strategies and you know sort of it, it come to a point where uh, with the State Department with our colleagues uh, across the State Department we were able to work on all the policies and strategies together and they were our USAID's uh, strategy on democracy rights and governance or the development response to violent extremism and insurgency or you know go, going down the line when we worked on the larger national security policy issues and we're around the table and I'll use the example of the security sector assistance reform I'm sure many <laughs> including Neil remember the years we spent on that it was the Department of Justice who constantly was questioning why USAID was in this space and it, we were 
so close after like three years of negotiation to get this policy to the president. And um, all of a sudden, DOJ raised all these objections and pointed at USAID, <laughs> and Gail Smith was uh, the director at the time at the NSC, she said, okay, we're not leaving this room, it's a Friday afternoon, we're bringing in pizza until we solve this. So we didn't get to go outside and prove it, but we did <laughs> you know, move it forward. But I think um, mm. it, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done on, on the interagency at the higher policy level, and once that tone is set, because otherwise <laughs> you can have you know, great leadership at the mission level, but you really do need it. The, yeah. yeah, the rule of law area was, was, I mean, I'm thinking back to the late 90s when there was actually finally a meeting between the Secretary of State and the Attorney <laughs> General to that same kind of, we're not leaving the room until we get a decision here about who has primary right. <coughs> authority over these issues. And so somehow the legal side has been yeah. particularly conflictive in yeah. certain ways. Chris, do you have some perspective on the interagency and grantees, Congress a bit? Can you talk yeah. about that? So let's move <clears throat> to another region if I can. Yeah. Um, and it's not exactly, it wasn't Russia, but it's former Soviet Union, newly independent states, Ukraine, Moldova, and Belarus. And uh, the time that I went there was the time that the Orange Revolution occurred. Um, and everybody was pretty much familiar with what happened at that time. Um, the the extent of collaboration there, particularly in Ukraine, was quite strong, and I think we were pretty much in sync with the, the State Department on that. Um, sometimes some of our grantees have their own foreign policy, and it's a little bit of a difficulty in, uh, in managing that process, but we were all working toward the same effort there. In Belarus, it was a somewhat different uh, situation. We had a good relationship, but at, um, um, sometimes difficult relationship with the, with, with the embassy there because when elections were taking place in Belarus, they wanted to take risks um, uh, with, um, um, I thought, the lives of Belarusian um, citizens in doing cross-border work from Lithuania back into, uh, into Belarus. And I thought that also put our um, own employees in Belarus in some potential danger um, because the backfire would have been on the U.S. aid um, um, as well as the embassy in, in Minsk. Um, but in, um, in where the main party was going on in, 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 uh, in Ukraine, um, there was always a very clear um, communication and agreement between the embassy and USAID about what our respective roles were going to be in, in supporting the process without seeming overly supportive of one of the particular candidates who everybody, you know, in their hearts wanted to see win. But the sensitivity of not demonstrating that um, um, partiality toward um, one of the major um, candidates was something that had to be managed uh, constantly um, and which was where we had some of our more difficult situations with some of our implementing partners um, who um, were less, um, less um, rigid about the idea of impartiality um, um, in, the, uh, in the process. But it got so, I mean, we were basically, as you know, the, the central area down there called the Maidan uh, was where a lot of the demonstrations were taking place and people were setting up tents in there. We were not even allowed to go down there doing any um, during any um, um, of the demonstrations. Um, and that was a tension also for some of our Ukrainian employees who were clearly involved in the political process. And so they did what they did, but um, it was in an unofficial way. So it varied in the three countries, in, in Moldova it was also a very good relationship and there were a lot of things going on there as well. Um, that part of the former Soviet Union was certainly different from Russia. Um, there were long um, inclinations towards independence on the part of Ukrainians and resentment toward a lot of the policies uh, from Russia when they were part of the Soviet Union. And so there was a great ideological tension and pull going on in that part 
of the world at this time. It's still going on, but it was going on even during the elections. Um, and while we had even cooperation from the government at that time and from regional um, um, administrations in the oblasts, Seeing what the government tried to do in the end to manipulate the vote count in the first in the first uh, stage of the election um, had me believe then that they were just sort of tolerating us, knowing all in time at the end they were going to be able to um, um, mm -hmm. change the results of the election, and it failed, and it went to into the into the legal process. Mm -hmm. In fact, mm -hmm. um, it was in favor of um, a new a new vote. Mm -hmm. um, Anyway, though, um, and then in Central Asia, I think we always had pretty good relationships with the gov with the with the um, with the embassies. But there were a lot of sensitivities in the various um, countries of Central Asia, mm -hmm. where they really didn't want to have much to do with us, and that would be Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan, essentially. Um, yeah, but um, okay. yeah. So, yeah, I have more questions. I want to turn to some other issues, but I'd actually like to pause here on these two large areas of sensitivities and pressures within the sort of the, the U.S. process side and uh, get some reactions or thoughts. I know I can see people who I know have thoughts about these issues. I have Larry Garber, Neil, others who I've <laughs> talked with about these issues over many years, Jim and others. I'd like to just give people a chance to come into this discussion a bit, either you're welcome to just make a comment if you want to make a comment. If you want to disguise it as a question, you can disguise it as a question. <laughs> I'll start there in the back, then I'll, I'll come here and go there. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Woody Navin. Um, I want to pick up on Chris Crowder's statement that sometimes our partners have their own foreign policy and bring well, Africa okay. into, the, into the discussion here a bit. Would anyone like to comment about Sudan and the role of our Christian NGOs there? leading us into certain directions in Sudan. So, excuse me, South Sudan. I'm not sure there's anybody I here with the experience in Africa. But maybe let's come here, let's get some more out on the table and we'll see if somebody would like to go in this, this uh, right here in the front, this woman, yeah. <laughs> Please, there, there's a microphone coming on your right there. Thank you. And make sure you introduce yourself to the group. Yeah. I'm Marilyn Merrick, and I just wanted to Hold the gets on. Hello? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, Marilyn Merrick, and I just wanted to ask if you might relate a little bit to other divisions within the society, such as tribal alliances or religious alliances, um, which often are part of the picture, um, and that hasn't been alluded to yet, mm -hmm. but I'm sure it's in there. So anything you might want to contribute on those lines? Let me take one or two more, then we'll come back to the panel. I'd like to take Larry there, and then I'll come here and there. We've got plenty of hands up, so uh, let's, uh, this uh, person r right here. There we go. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so a couple if of you points. you could introduce yourself. Larry Garber, yeah. uh, former USAID, like everyone else here, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, we but, but first of all, I think it's, <laughs> it's, it's interesting that the assumption of the panel, which I think is quite different than 30 years ago, is how much uh, we take for granted that DRG or DG is, is a integral part, and, and that's a starting place. So a couple of caveats uh, along the lines of what you're saying. One is the assumption that aid is always the ones that are pushing for more activism on the democracy front, and the State Department is always the ones that are holding us back, I think is, is just not true. I mean, there are lots of instances in which the State Department wants to push forward, and we're very concerned about whether it's our employees or our other programs or the like. So we, we need to be at least fair in, in terms of uh, recognizing that, that there are times when, the, when this issue cuts the other way. Mm -hmm. The second, and this is the one that, that has always intrigued me, is, you know, I mean, clearly democracy is different in terms of uh, putting us into the political uh, position, uh, you know, in discussions at the uh, embassy level and the like. But the notion that our other programs, our non-DG programs, are not also in some ways interfering in some ways in internal politics, I think is, you know, is something that we, we, we like to think, but it just isn't true. I mean, when we're promoting policy reform on the economic side, 
Mm -hmm. I mean, we're doing as much to intervene or, or affect or try to affect uh, policy sure. as we do on the DG side. So I think, again, we need to reflect on what really is uh, the difference between the two. And I'll just give one anecdote uh, that I remember when I came back to aid in, in 2009. It relates to the Egypt case that Chris was talking about. And I was talking with uh, <coughs> a colleague at State who was in charge of the Middle East, the Middle East portfolio, the DAS for uh, democracy. And she said to me, um, you know, Larry, we got a great, she had just been out to Cairo, she said, we got a great division of labor because we're doing the democracy work and you guys, to protect your programs, we're keeping you out of some of the democracy work. So again, that was just her position, but I think sometimes that is, uh, that is what happens. <coughs> This, I think woman here would like to come in, and then I'll come back behind. Yeah, yes, here in the front, in the front row, please. Thank you. And there, Dusen. Um, I was struck by a comment a couple of you made about um, knowing where your partners were, maybe even being captured a little bit by where your partners were, but not uh, picking up on broader political or social trends, not understanding the context. And I'm wondering, as you've reflected on it, what might you have looked for to try and catch some of those trends and, and factor those in? What, you know, what, what did you miss in the, um, in, in the enthusiasm of your programming? Mm -hmm. I'm take one more, then come back to panel. Right behind you, if you just pass the microphone, then I'll, I'll, I'll see you over here, and we'll, we'll make sure we get over here. Sorry. Uh, good morning. Uh, Neil Levine, uh, eight alumni, former DRG center director. Um, first of all, a comment. Um, thank you all for the panel, Tom, uh, for the fights you fought and the lessons you passed on. Uh, it made a difference for a lot of the folks that worked at AID during that time. I want to turn to the question of evidence. Mm -hmm. In the sector, the, the holy grail is what works under what circumstances yeah. and why. Yeah. Also, how much yeah. money, resource time. Um, from your presentations, and I think from a lot of people's experience, what seems to matter more than evidence is the local context, our relationship, who's at the table. Not to say, and you don't want to be in the position of arguing against good evidence for why programs work, but as mission directors in each case, what was the role of evidence? Where, where did it find it helped your case? Where did it find the lack of evidence hurt your case in some of these? Uh, we were actually going to come to monitoring and evaluation evidence. So actually, let's hold that thought, okay. Neil, and let people respond to some of the other things. So then we'll come back to it and we move to the next phase. But I'm going to let me come back to the panel for a minute, then come back to you guys. Yeah. Chris, I think one or two things that said prompted you. So. Yes, this uh, point that, that Larry raised, and I'd like to talk about governance for a moment. We haven't really talked about, um, the we've been talking about the traditional democracy type mm -hmm. programs and not so much about governance and the way these programs can sometimes not only be politically um, 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 contentious, but they're also ways to introduce democratic values without necessarily um, um, engaging some of these questions directly. And I'll talk about um, land reform and titling of, of, of farmers. Um, in Ukraine, um, talk about um, education programs which engage um, engage parents in in the schools. There are a whole range of programs that um, I think um, introduce the basis for. Uh, yeah, I mean, they are issues of democracy or the values of the way we govern a society. And they, I think they induce the people themselves to undertake their own um, organizational uh, development in support of these kinds of programs. And working in, in another one is um, on the technical side, organizing, um, organizing the controllers of all the oblasts in Ukraine um, to, um, to do um, um, effective kinds of accounting and, mm -hmm. um, and assessment of the programs. A lot of these things achieve some of the same kinds of objectives in a very quiet way um, than just attacking some mm -hmm. of the issues okay. 
head on. Right, good. Beth, would you like to, thank you, Chris. You want to respond to any of the comments or questions that were done? Um, yeah, this was a question on reaching social sectors and broadening our, our base of um, engagement, if you will. Um, I think that that's something that's really important to do. It's what we do when we begin to, at the very um, first stage of designing programs is, you know, who are the interested parties here and um, how do we engage them to be sure that whatever we do is going to advance um, their interests. Um, and so I had made reference earlier to indigenous organizations and that's a really important, again, in the Latin American context and in certain countries, that's a, a really important um, group to engage early um, because uh, we often you know can bypass them by talking to elites in the capital city and then you know we'll mm. fall flat in our faces when we go to the Amazon and try to implement a program where these people haven't been engaged so you know that's certainly uh, appropriate um, religious groups that's a little bit um, touchy because um, you know we we don't want to support one religious group over another religious group but we do have to take into consideration of course um, the views of those um, institutions and those organizations as we design programs I know that's particularly the case on the health sector in Latin America, again, we have a history of um, running into walls at full speed um, be on reproductive rights, as an example, um, because uh, of particular beliefs within um, those communities. Um, so I do think that we do a pretty decent job, and not just in the democracy sector, but I would say, you know, in a generally in um, understanding, you know, who is going to benefit, who are the losers and who are the winners, um, and to try to uh, be upfront about that so, and have our eyes open as we walk into um, these mm -hmm. very sensitive yeah. Um, yeah. situations. Thank you. Yeah, Susan. I'll try and pick up really quickly on, on three. One, on the faith-based groups, I think that's a really important issue you raised in the context of South Sudan, but um, as we've seen, um, particularly the political role of engagement with faith-based groups, and, and to be frank, we're seeing that today, and the role that USAID plays then and is expected to play and being directed to play working with certain groups is, is um, I think, something we absolutely have to keep keep a very close eye and, and speak as development professionals when our first principle is it, it can do more harm than good. Um, so uh, that's the first. I want to pick up on what Larry said about, uh, and you know, Larry and Tom were, when I talked about like it not being really a sector, they were the ones early in my career who kind of gave me the uh, the strength, like, no, there's a lot to that's been done here that will be done here and just want to particularly um, call them out and thank them uh, because uh, the points that Larry makes about DRG is not separate. Everything we do um, and you know, when I was counselor, just trying to talk to about new officers coming in to always look at it through that political context. And one of the questions, right, we always got was, well, what if you don't agree with the policy? And always had to say, if you really deeply do not believe with the policy and you cannot execute the policy, then you do need to consider leaving because that is our job. We are part of a country team. You can, you, you absolutely should be looking whether you're an economic growth officer or a health officer, maybe you're seeing something from a policy perspective that you absolutely is wrong. Your job is to vocalize that. You need to have that seat at the table. It's not about you. You're representing you know, development at the table. And then that's a very personal decision. But I think often um, uh, folks in the past didn't look so much as their role as being political. And whether you're working on economic reform or mm -hmm. health sector reform and political. education reform, yeah. it's, all, it's, all it's, it's all political. And then just the point about, um, you know, there were often times, right, we were pushed to do things. Um, and we were the ones saying, no, we shouldn't do it for some of the examples that, that Chris, I think, appropriately gave. Um, but for other reasons, higher political objectives, whether it was the White House or Congress, we haven't talked a lot about Congress, but I really came of age with mm. Senator Helms, the barbers right here, <laughs> many times up on, on the Hill, and you know, Senator Helms in Nicaragua was really uh, directing the policy more than, <laughs> more than anyone at the time. And then finally, coming back to Anne's point, which I, I'm, I'm glad you asked that, because I, I do want to make sure that I'm also capturing the looking back of not understanding the context, and, and, and I was fortunate and again, to have that year at NDU um, with John Teft, who was my, our DCM at the time, but uh, when I was in Russia, and that transition. And it was a lot of reflection on, I think, you know, we're, we're very aspirational. Uh, that's just, mm -hmm. I think, who we are as a country. We, we believe in this vision and our values. And, and um, even though there can be the underlying currents, um, I, and I think that's just something not 
in the context of Russia, but every country we work in, and being able to step back, and that's what, again why I think it is so important to do not only mm -hmm. these sessions, but what the Alumni Association mm -hmm. does with the oral mm -hmm. histories and capturing the lessons, and not just mm -hmm. learning lessons for lessons' sake, but most importantly, it really is for the future generation because they're stepping into, you know, a, a pretty big mess in the world right now. And so I think the more we can share our mm -hmm. experience and what we would have done differently in the country mm -hmm. team or from a policy perspective, to help them have the tools, most importantly, as they move mm -hmm. forward. Let me bring in a couple of those. I have this gentleman, and then here, and then here. Uh, let's start here, sir. Thank you. Yeah, we hear you. Thank you, Franklin Moore. Um, I would like to get um, maybe a little more explicitly from the three panelists, something that was raised by Larry. So if you look at the Africa Bureau, where there never was much money for um, democracy, yeah. rights, it's and true. governance. Yeah. And there was tons of money for health. 75% for the Bureau at points in time. Right. And if you look at probably the two biggest initiatives, certainly when we took on PEPFAR, it meant we were now working with civil society that had little or no rights. And when we looked at um, maternal and child health, it was clear that the role of women in governance really needed to change if we were going to be successful. Mm -hmm. So it is a case where money that was health money was literally spent on rights and governance. Mm -hmm. And I would like to have them talk a little more about the relationship between democracy, governance, and human rights as its own issue versus right. it as something very important to be successful in other sectors. Okay, we'll, yeah. we'll come back to that. Thank you. That's it. This gentleman, and then here. Yeah. And then get to that. yeah. Uh, my name is Irving Rosenthal. I, I just wanted to put this into a little context. Larry talked about his experience 30 years ago. Well, when I joined the organization, it was known as ICA. <laughs> that was 60 years ago, <laughs> and so we've moved along. <laughs> well, uh, I came in into ICA as a public administration program assistant. And hmm. what public administration then meant mm -hmm. was really administration. Yeah. How to do budgeting, mm -hmm. how to do personnel management. Yeah. and we worked with, to set up a school in Turkey uh, to teach people how to do uh, you know, management operations. Now we've been talking about democracy, it's very important, we didn't do it then. We're talking about larger government, governance, important, we didn't do it then. Uh, you're talking about politics, you know, we didn't, we didn't do it then. Uh, indeed, uh, I, we, I remember sending one uh, Turkish participant to the United States, and he came back and he said he didn't like the training in the United States. Of course, they didn't tell me how to do it. <laughs> and so I uh, think that we, maybe you know, we've gotten too sophisticated, yeah. and we have to maybe go back or mix them up and make sure you know politics and policy is fine, but how very specifically do you do it? Thank you. Okay, here, and then I'll come here, yeah. Um, just behind you, to your right, no. Directly behind you, there you go. Hi, good morning, uh, Bill Hammy. I just have two Hello. observations. Sorry, we're still, this, this mic is, uh, closer to your mouth. I think closer? you have to just be right. In the Can you hear me now? That's good. Okay, yeah. uh, good morning, Bill Hammick. I just have two observations. One is about leadership and the need for support and or at least benign leadership. Uh, the other is about budget. And as Susan knows in Russia, by about 98, 99, there were an estimated some 50,000 non-governmental organizations across uh, these 11 or so time zones in Russia. And uh, there were over 100 independent media organizations, many of whom USAID supported. There were uh, pilot jury uh, activities going on. There was a lot happening in within perhaps five to eight years. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. Much of the independence of those groups were gone, and many of the groups were gone with uh, Putin coming in. Uh, that's one. <coughs> the other is in Ethiopia, in a big meeting, Mellis made it clear he didn't like NGOs. Uh, many of you know John Graham, who at the time worked for SAVE and then joined USAID. He was loud and uh, <coughs> quite clear about uh, his thoughts in front of Mellis, and Mellis basically called NGOs uh, fly in the ointment. He was kind of, I would call, a benign dictator. Um, the other observation is on budget. Uh, I just finished a stint with ABA Rowley overseas, and I was really surprised at how much of their funding for the kinds of things we're talking about here, rule of law, women's rights, and the like, how much of their funding came from State Department. So just a question on budget. Mm -hmm. I know at one point there was a lot of talk in aid about an earmark for DG, DRG. Mm -hmm. You know, that's an important part. If USA is going to be a player, they need to put some money on the table. Yeah. Thanks. For sure. Okay. We have, I want to come here, a lot of hands, which is great. So let's just keep moving. I want to come right in here and then come to Marilyn, Jim, and I'll get over to you guys there. Okay. So please go ahead. All right. Ned, really, I don't know if we have time to be perspective about a particular region, but yeah. we've mentioned um, sub-Saharan Africa a bit and hmm. faith-based. I'm wondering if we took Ethiopia and Sudan and the Congo and, and Nigeria as sort of a problem area south of the Sahel. And, and then also thought about climate change and thought about the fact that sub-Saharan Africa is probably going to surpass China and India and then both together in terms of population. Mm -hmm. It's a long-term problem. I don't know if there's any way that we can think about how you build institutions, mm -hmm. democratic institutions yeah. in that area, whether they are specific to DR, um, democracy or um, the, the health or education, et cetera. Yeah, that's good. Okay, Marilyn. Yeah. Marilyn Zach, uh, question. We've been talking at the broader, okay, but I'm concerned about the internal staff mm -hmm. and the quality or the lack thereof and the inability to get rid of people who truly aren't performing. Now, <clears throat> I have a particular example. Uh, especially when it came to elections in the first one in El Salvador, where um, this was in 84, <coughs> 82, we uh, funded the observers, and then we had to do the computers because um, the government would only do a, a election if they had the computers. So the Latin America Bureau sent me someone who was... Um, very computer literate, and he reported to me every so often when he came up, and always very nice, and I went down for the first round, and I immediately knew something's going on wrong, okay, and it was his manipulation of things, information, and in between the first and second round, I went to Honduras uh, for a long weekend, uh, to visit my colleagues there, and I mentioned the guy, the individual's name, and they were shocked because he had been thrown out of the country because an irate husband had to put a baseball bat in his car, okay? And he was going around um, pre pretending he was CIA with all the different money. When I came back to talk to the Bureau, how could you do this, okay? You knew this. Okay, and it was Buster Brown and Peter Askin. They knew that, all right? And so not only that, they were left with all kinds of other issues because he had talked to the press about the labor union uh, people who were killed. Okay, so um, anyway, um, he started um, pre presenting himself as an election expert. All right, and then there was an issue with Bolivia, and I came in and I said, he's not an election expert, et cetera. But he kept going on. And then also then it was in Guatemala. And in Guatemala, he got caught um, bribing and get, um, ending up being put in jail, okay? So lo and behold, what happens? Uh, um, he, Marilyn, he goes we need off. to... Okay, I I, but I'm just saying... Yeah. 
Um, he showed up as a, <coughs> a, 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 a yeah. corruption expert yeah. in Santo Domingo, okay? Mm. And he had just got early release from prison. Mm. And his resume did not say that he was a felon. Yeah. And I had to go <laughs> and tell the ambassador okay. we had a convicted yeah. felon. Now, I have seen this, and he pops up various places, okay? But it's the inability of the aid missions and the directors and Aid Washington to really get rid of some of these people and to make sure people know about their backgrounds. Okay. Jim, I think you wanted to come in. Yeah. Jim Courtney. Uh, yeah. uh, yeah. Yes, I had yeah. one thing I wanted to pick up on uh, Bill Hammock's point about Rowley and the discussion we've had here about interagency sensitivities. Uh, when we were starting out <laughs> in this, Make sure you speak it, right it was impossible to get other agencies to engage. You know, the Justice Department resisted being involved because they thought they might get in trouble. This might be politically sensitive in Congress. Uh, the State Department, you know, wanted to control, but they did not engage. The uh, INM Bureau, before it was INL, uh, wanted only to train narcotics mm -hmm. actors, mm -hmm. not anybody else in, in law enforcement. Uh, that's all changed, but what, the, what I wanted to get at is when I have done some recent uh, consulting work, I go around to all of the agencies and I ask them what they're doing in the country that relates to the subject of my consultation on a, on a DRG matter, usually an assessment. And I find that the counterterrorism people have a program, mm -hmm. the population and refugee people have a program, the regional bureau and state may have a program, DRL has a program, INL has a program, Commerce has a program, mm -hmm. Justice has a program, yep. and maybe I missed some of these. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I wonder how USAID can carry forward with yeah. work mm -hmm. in this area at a time when you have the Treasury <coughs> Department or the yeah. State Department or the Justice Department yeah. going to the country, sending their representatives, yeah. doing their independent assessments, talking to the people who are supposed to be you know, the partners of the USG. And some embassies can control this and some can't. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder how, mm -hmm. how the panel sees mm -hmm. dealing with the enormous fragmentation yeah. we've right. had mm -hmm. in yeah. this work mm -hmm. as <coughs> its, ability, as its yeah. impact on the effectiveness of USAID's work. Okay. Um, do you want to comment on that, Chris? But I want to keep okay. letting people come in. So everybody yeah. keep comments short because time's starting to get short. Mm -hmm. Yes, my least favorite, um, my least favorite um, uh, example of government uh, or description of um, agency cooperation is something called the whole of government approach. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my first real experience with the whole of government approach was in Iraq, um, where um, virtually every agency or sub agency of the US government found a reason to be there um, and the and to get the funds divided even into a smaller pots um, then um, that should have happened I mean and so there was always an effort of the guy who was the coordinator of the assistance in Iraq he had to appease every single agency um, by dividing up that pot and dividing up some of the activities that um, agents typically would undertake USDA getting agricultural development instead of just um, instead of just trying to market U.S. goods back to I mean uh, agricultural goods back to the United States. This was a constant struggle to yeah. um, to deal with the fragmentation of 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 the assistance budget. And only later in the process did someone come along in the State Department and say no more. All you other agencies get out. Aid is going to get the money to do all this work, which was a really good um, a good conclusion. But it's happened elsewhere. But that's my worst example of it. Um, and I think it is a the idea of whole of government approach. While it may have sounded good as a kind of ideological uh, um, context, it hasn't worked very well. Mm -hmm. I want to come back to the Carol, and then I'm going to come here to this one. But you had your hand up, okay? 
Yes, and then these, you and you, yeah, next, yeah. Could we have a microphone, sir? Yeah, microphone, either way, yeah, right here, in the front row, please. Thank you. Hi, uh, Carol Peasley. You have to speak just right a, right into these Okay, mics, sorry. So. Um, yeah. Just uh, reacting to, to Chris's example in Egypt about the, the risks of working directly with uh, local civil society organizations, to contrast it with, uh, <clears throat> I'm at the moment helping Farouk Mangera, whom some of you may know, who was one of the early uh, FSNs working in South Africa, his oral history interview, in which uh, Farouk talks about the, in lauds, the willingness of aid to work directly with anti-apartheid groups in South Africa, mm -hmm. and that that direct approach, not only uh, it, it developed the relationships which the mission was then able to use when a majority-led government came in. And so I think that what I'm really doing is urging people mm -hmm. when this oral history, when it finally gets edited, even though it has some very strange tangential comments from Farouk, and any of you know him will understand that, <laughs> but um, <laughs> it's an eloquent statement of aid working very, very differently uh, yeah. With civil society and making a huge yeah. difference in a country. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Could you hand your microphone to this woman here and then come to you? Yeah, you're next and then I'll come to you. Thank you very much for the panel. Paul Ofini. Um, I understand that the DRG officers now are all cycling through training in public finance management, one or two courses. And at the same time, uh, USAID, well, I, the question was I can see that being used for. Uh, pr uh, preventing corruption, uh, helping in the further development of local institutions so that they could carry on self rely you know, they could do it themselves and not be dependent upon intermediaries uh, from AID contractors and grantees to, you know, uh, watch over the monies for them and that sort of thing. As you see the evolving role of DRG officers and, of course, decentralization of governments and the underpinnings of, uh, you know, funds transfers from the national governments to the local governments. Do you see the skill sets for the DRG officers moving maybe a little bit more for toward the governance side of the equation versus perhaps the democracy part of it? How do you see that, let's say, in the near-term future? Thank you. Susan, you probably are closest to that because of that, and then I'll come to this Yeah, one. and I think it sort of bleeds into some of the other um, uh, questions or points that were made particularly related to the budget and resourcing and, and Franklin's point about, you know, across sectors and, and whatnot. So, it, you know, with the reorganization and the creation of the DDI, as you probably all know, uh, there was a real debate, and Tom being closest to this, having just retired as counselor, about whether the DRG Center should, as it, uh, as Dacha was made into three separate bureaus, whether DRG should be a separate bureau in itself or whether it should be part of the development um, bureau and what are the skill sets and, and there was great debate as you can imagine and it's only right DRG officers can do. We'll, <laughs> we'll definitely let everyone know how we feel. And you know honestly I think um, it's it I think it was the right decision and it gets back to Paula's um, point that uh, you want it to have be integrated within the the broader development but you also need it you know across the agency and and so you know it, the skill set is evolving and it's and it's changing um, but that being said I think at its core the fundamentals are are, are essential and um, uh, Carol just gave a great example from South Africa and I do think uh, and, and Bill talked about it in Russia and, and every place not only I, I serve but most importantly Importantly visited. One of the things I just really truly believe is unique that we do uh, is that we do plant those seeds, and you know they're 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 not up to us to water them every single day. What what I think we've seen right in all of our experiences, um, many years later, uh, those seeds have have blown into those trees that ultimately lead to that wave, and they'll often go back and they'll point to the work that that we and our partners have done on the ground, and this is really the long term. So my point is that it's the long term we have yeah. to really be. be Here's a hard on. question, Susan, for you <clears throat> that I want to get back to the audience. If a young uh, young person just joined USAID and wants to be a DRG officer and they say, is this a path to becoming a mission director? 
I say, mission director, who cares about that? You have more fun doing project design. Um, you know, I, you know, so yes, I think that most importantly, what we tried to do, at least you know, in my last few years in Washington, was was to elevate technical fields, and that technically you could go on to senior leadership, not necessarily because you wanted to be a mission director, but you wanted to be the senior technical leader in, in those areas, right. and whether it was health or education or you know, mm -hmm. agriculture or resilience across mm -hmm. uh, across the board. But, but can I answer the the point? I think that mm. keeps coming up is really important, and it's an urgent issue. And I don't know if UAA does advocacy, but I'll urge advocacy on this point of the budget, and and the fragmentation that is, so many people gave some great examples. Uh, but with the reorganization, and with obviously all the challenges that um, the 150 account is having right now. Uh, with the budget, it, we thought it was bad, or at least I thought it was bad in my last couple of years, how slow and how difficult it is. It's, it's, uh, it's beyond um, yeah. difficult right now. And I think it's really incumbent on folks as you're out there talking and you're on the hill and you're or you're talking to other, I think you guys are going to have USGLC this afternoon and whatnot. We have to really not advocate for the 150 account, but the critical role that particularly this uh, this sector plays. And everybody gave examples of it, just not only diminishing and being mm -hmm. manipulated, but the fragmentation. And that's what worries me most mm -hmm. about the future of the sector today. Mm -hmm. Good. I want to come to this woman here. Sorry. Then this gentleman, you, and then over here. Yeah. <clears throat> My name is Marcy Birnbaum, and certainly coming up through the education sector. You got to really put the microphone close to your lips, unfortunately. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, I'm Marcy Birnbaum, and coming up through the education sector, I can certainly attest to the fact that principles of citizen participation and so much goes across. I'm going to be a little bit of a rabble riser here. Um, and this may not apply to your time, but. Uh, we do aspire to democracy. We do aspire to rule of law and good governance. Um, but what happens, maybe it's more for now than when you were in there, when your counterparts in the government say, but you don't practice these things. <laughs> yes. you push them on us. Indeed. Indeed, indeed. Okay, let me pass. Especially Just right have the microphone right. to this gentleman right here. Let me, yeah. 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 Go ahead, sir. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for this panel. Uh, Tom Stahl. When I was in Ethiopia a few years ago, the ambassador and I met with the Minister of Justice, Minister of Foreign Affairs, and several ministers to say that the Human Rights Report was about to come out. And of course, it was going to have uh, things that the government won't like uh, in there, uh, that they've got political prisoners, that people have been tortured, that you know the NGO law and the uh, journalism law was, was strict, and uh, the ambassador suggested to the government you could respond to it in three different ways, in one of three ways. One is you could just ignore it. The second is you could complain about it and reject it and say this is untrue and, you know, make a big issue of it. Or the third is you can say, okay, we don't agree, but let's cooperate and work on this. And he said, I hope you choose the third. And they said, no, we will choose the second. <laughs> we will deny every single instance. We will fight back you and everything. So my question is, you know, here's sensitivity, right? <laughs> What's the best way of dealing with that sensitivity? <laughs> Do we attack them directly with our democracy and human rights programs? Or do we find some other way to deal with it? Okay, let me take one or two more questions yeah. come right here, this gentleman, and then over to here. Yeah, okay. Right, right here, yeah, right there, yeah, great. Hi, uh, yes, up to my mouth, thanks. So full disclosure, I am not retired. Yeah, I am I the, uh, <laughs> <Let him in. laughs> I don't know about that. Uh, I'm the, I'm the uh, vice president for the American Foreign Service Association for USAID. So I am a current USAID Foreign Service Officer, sorry that. But I have a question because of I want to look ahead to the future. Good. Yeah. Um, okay. Under the restructuring, part of the rationale was to move the DRG Center out of Dacha because it has just been overshadowed by crisis mm -hmm. and headlines. I'm curious the panel's thoughts and others' thoughts during coffee break. Putting it into a gigantic technical pot now, mm -hmm. is it going to be elevated and get the attention it needs? Is that a solution, or how can you look at it? Your question, if I, a young foreign service officer came in and said, is the DRG pathway, it's struggling right now. Because in the DRG center, it's not democracy, rights, and governance. It's also 
break it all down. It's media. It's legislative. Mm -hmm. It's public affairs. It's financing for Mm self-reliance. The range of issues is only growing while the resources, both people and financial, are shrinking. And so I welcome the thoughts about whether this is the right answer, what we can do to elevate it. And going back to some of Larry's points, I do fully agree. I also am concerned. I moved from the EG to the DG side because I got tired of banging my head on governance on the EG side and thought maybe I could push on the DG side. How do we do this integration? How do we make it work internally looking forward? You've all faced the challenges. You don't have to worry about it day to day, but the agency is struggling with this still. So I'd welcome the panel's thoughts and others. Thank you. A couple more, then we'll come back for final comments. These two gentlemen over here, um, all the way back against the wall there. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I'm Mike Crosswell, an economist um, and policy analyst uh, before I retired. And I have three um, sort of challenging propositions to put on the table. Uh, The first, uh, I think, relates to Neil's point, and it's a question, you know, how confident are we about the state of the art on political development? That is, it's, I think democracy is an important goal, it's a real sector, but if we're going to spend money, right. we need to have, right. uh, spend it on the basis, uh, from some sort of knowledge base. Right. So how good is right. the knowledge base, or yeah. how confident can we be that we can spend money wisely? Mm-hmm. Uh, the second challenging proposition is, Larry talked about this being integral, you know, but if you, and you could make that a philosophical question. We should define development in ways that include democracy. And we could be here for weeks discussing that. But if we look at the empirical record, we, uh, Jim was careful to say democracy can go along with economic growth, but there's so many examples where countries are making development progress Mm-hmm. but not doing well on democracy, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. or doing well on democracy, but not making development mm-hmm. progress. Mm-hmm. So that suggests that we're dealing with a distinct goal, and uh, that has all sorts of implications for our strategies and prioritizing countries, for instance. Okay. The third uh, challenging comment is the phrase democratic governance, which seems to weave in uh, democracy with other aspects of governance. <clears throat> yeah. But if you look at the Kaufman Cray Worldwide Governance Indicators, there's one that corresponds very closely to to democracy, and then there's five others, really, for other dimensions of governance. And the point with that is similar to the point with development. The correlations or the the links aren't that tight. You can see countries doing poorly on democracy, but good on other aspects of governance, or good on development policies as rated by the bank, some of the highest performers uh, for yeah. the bank are terrible on democracy. Mm-hmm. So, so the third is, okay. shouldn't we be untangling uh, democracy from other parts of governments? Okay, thanks for those. We'll take a final comment right in front of this gentleman right here. Yeah, you, sir. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, thank you, uh, Lex Riefel. I will be eternally grateful to Alex Shakow for sending me to Indonesia uh, when mm-hmm. I was... Uh, uh, thinking of what to do after a uh, graduate school. and uh, But I left USAID 40, 40, more than 40 years ago. Um, Indonesia and Burma, however, have been very much part of my life. And these are two countries where sort of democracy and uh, governance, got democracy in particular, has been uh, a part of the US uh, uh, foreign policy effort push. And I think we've done badly, really badly. and from outside, outside the aid community, uh, my sense is that we really got to give up democracy and focus on governance. Governance is what's really critical for people, for human lives. And I think one of the problems is that uh, Congress doesn't understand this. And we sort of have this religious attachment to democracy. And it's going to be really hard for uh, USAID and the foreign policy community to sort of let go of democracy and focus on governance. Another problem is that you know I, when I go to when I talk to people about Burma, I say, if you don't uh, speak the Burmese language, you don't know what's going on in this country. You can't know what's going on in this country. And I don't think we speak the language. Enough of us speak the language of these countries enough to know yeah. how to uh, sort of fix how to make their countries more democratic and so forth. And the problem with uh, the democracy part is to me is political parties. 
And we just don't, mm. uh, political parties don't work in a lot of countries. They're yeah. inconsistent with good governance. How about here? And, <laughs> no. So we need to. I just have two other things to say. One is, you know, uh, if, if we really want to fix uh, governance, we, we may be, where we, the biggest payoff may be working with the military. Because you may, f may find the military has a lot to do with governance exactly. in the future. And the other thing, of course, is youth. Mm -hmm. And we really have to focus on youth because mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. all right. You know, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So I want to uh, <laughs> give each of the panelists one minute, and let's try to stay future oriented. We've mentioned some issues regarding the future budget, uh, where DRG fits within the agency, um, <clears throat> issues like Africa, as Africa faces a, a complex and difficult future. Where is it going to fit in? Same questions that you raised there. And, and other issues. So let's just keep our eyes to the future. But final statement. Let's go in reverse order this time. Chris, do you want to, any final thoughts on what you heard? Well, I mean, it's hard to. <laughs> it's hard to. What's your name again? <laughs> um, it's hard to focus on any one thing here. These are all very complex issues. Um, I happen to agree that I th I'll make one other point that sort of relates to governance, and that is. Um, at least until I left, murmuring the word institutional development was, um, was not something one did. And as uh, Irv was talking about, um, I think there are a lot of things in the whole public administration sphere and still working with the public sector, whether we're doing other things in democracy mm -hmm. um, uh, in, uh, as well, um, are critical. Um, and I don't want to talk, I hate to mention the word Iraq here, but, but that place um, was, as you know, most of the skilled people left or were not uh, allowed to take up their jobs after the, the U.S. came in there with debathification. Um, so these institutions, in, in a sense, had to be remade. And nothing else was going to happen. Um, in that society unless the public institutions could deliver the services that the people needed. Um, and I found far more um, satisfaction in trying to deal with, and measurable satisfaction as it were, in dealing with some of those questions than helping the Iraqis have another election. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, I wanted to pick up on this discussion about uh, democracy and governance and economic growth and the exchange between the two. First, I think we should be training, co-training DG and EG officers together um, as it relates to public administration, mm -hmm. for example. I've been in a post where we used DG money to finance mm -hmm. tax reform because right. um, that's the money that we had at the time. But it also mm -hmm. works the other way. Um, mm -hmm. I was in India and we had a women's rights program for Muslim women. And the idea of the program was to go to the Quran. We had imams working with us to go to the Quran and look at cite passages from the Quran right. that supports the rights of women. And it's there, believe it or not. And so um, that was the purpose of the program, and we had DG money that we were using for it. So I met with this group of Muslim women, and one of the women who was there um, had just recently joined this group, and she had been beaten regularly by her uh, husband. She was the third wife. Um, she was in tears, and they said, dry up your tears. You know, we are going to give you some resources under our grant to do job training and to um, get a loan to start a business. We're using DG money to do this? And, but three years later, I met this woman again. She was in a beautiful green sari. She had on gold bangles. She had a little business. She hired three men. And as she said, I bow to no man except for God. And so this was DG money. But to improve the, the agency of these right women, right. we really needed to be doing something other than just simply talking about the Quran and, and women's rights. The real rights, uh, uh, the, the real way that I could see these women gaining that agency was being economically independent or being able to contribute to the family income. And that's what really, I thought, um, made perfect sense. But it was a completely different program than it was designed to be with DG money doing economic growth, basically. 
Thank you. Finally, thanks. And picking up on that, you know, just some final thoughts um, on the budget and DRG and the policy, uh, the, the importance of the flexibility, and, and we often constrain ourselves in boxes. I was just on the Hill the other day, and one of the things they were uh, looking at is how can we write into the, not the first CR, but the next CR that's coming, the flexibility for the agency to be able to do exactly these things, because we, we absolutely need that. We're not going to have more money, um, and we're already overly earmarked. So again, I get back to the advocacy role that the UAA plays, and nobody knows this better than, than this group here and beyond. And the importance, we haven't talked uh, as much, we've talked a lot about programming, and obviously the controversies uh, around democracy, rights, or governance, or public administration programming, but the policy is absolutely fundamental. And, and everything we do is within that policy environment. And so um, we obviously have in USAID our policy bureau, and we know what that was like when we lost PPC uh, for some time, and, and just the incredible gap uh, that it had on our ability to really perform. Uh, we created PPL, as you know, with the reorganization, the policy resource and programming, I think is the PRP, is the name of the Bureau. Tom, you can tell me if it's wrong. That has not been approved by the Hill uh, for political reasons. And again, it gets back to the importance of the uh, policy strategy and budget coming together. So I would leave with that sort of plea of, um, of this voice, uh, the voice that the UAA had this week in, in uh, support of Bill Taylor was, was tremendous. And I, I just hope that we can do more um, in order to advance uh, our agenda publicly as well. OK, that's a good note. Let's thank our hardworking panel and thank all of you for <laughs> taking part. Good. All right, we're off the hook. <clears throat>all right so um next we're we're moving on to the next event and to introduce that event um i'll turn to alex shakow who himself needs no introduction so i won't give him one um at this point but we, alex then we know what he'd say if he did uh, and i'm so alex, glad you're on, not introducing me uh, come on come, come on up alex and and uh i'm here discussion all right there you go i'm that's i'm alex <laughs> oh, okay, can you, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you all for being here. This has really been terrific so far, and uh, Peter and I hope to make it uh, terrific for another hour of your time, and you'll be participating in that before long. Most of you know all there is to know about Peter McPherson. Uh, he was AIDS eighth administrator, serving from 1981 to 1987. He is perhaps the most admired and appreciated of all aid administrators. I was, I was lucky enough to interview him recently for his oral history, which you can all see at adst.org. And I think his life is a wonderful American success story. He grew up on a family dairy and fruit farm in Michigan, went to a one-room schoolhouse, and milked the cows every morning until he went off to Michigan State University. He was a Boy Scout, and he loved, he says, to trap muskrats, which I'm sure prepared him well for working in. Uh, he, he came by his politics genetically, as his grandfather was a powerful force in the Michigan Republican Party. From an early age, Peter was interested in public issues, and as a result, started a debate team at his high school that didn't have one before that, and at the Michigan State, where he became class president and head of the state of Michigan College Republicans. He joined the Peace Corps in 1963, an important step on the road to aid, and we'll pick that up in our discussion. He worked for five years as a lawyer, I always thought this was odd, for the IRS, and then for President Ford on presidential personnel. I, must, I first met Peter when he was a very active member of BIFAD, some of you may remember that, the uh, Board for International Food and Agricultural Development during the Carter administration. 
And then, as you see from his bio, there was a trail of big jobs. Aid Administrator, Deputy Secretary of the Treasury, Bank of America VP, President of Michigan State University, and from 2006 until now, President of APLU, the Association of Public and Land-Grant Universities. So, we are delighted you are here today, and we will talk for about 20, 25 minutes, and then we'll open it up to all of you to ask those questions uh, that you've been wanting to ask Peter all these years, but we're afraid to do. <laughs> so, in the audience today, we have a lot of returned Peace Corps volunteers, I think, and um, how would you describe the influence of your Peace Corps experience in Peru as it influenced your future career and aid connection particularly? Well, there's no question that that I was deeply interested in AID because of that Peace Corps experience. I mean, I was involved there in Lima and some of the aid projects, uh, but it was really getting into development in a deep way uh, there in, in Lima and around Peru. And from that, of course, I, I never did lose my interest, the BIFAD board and all the rest of that. So when there was an opportunity in the Reagan administration to become a administrator, it was to have a, a serious job in the administration. That was the one I wanted to have. Uh, I think in a in a in another dimension of all this is that <clears throat> the Peace Corps gave me real some real sense of how developing countries generally operate. I like to express it as being you'll learn that buses don't always come on time and maybe don't come. I, that was my Lima experience, and I think that, that volunteers around the world had their equivalent. And I, and, and I think that feeling of how countries don't, how they work and don't work in that whole environment was fundamental to my thinking about AID issues. Uh, when I got there, I found there were 500 former Peace Corps volunteers in AID, many of you, uh, and it, uh, I'm, I'm sure the, the agency generally thought, well, goodness, who is Reagan putting in to run AID? We have to watch out. But then when they found out I was a Peace Corps volunteer, I at least got a second look. <laughs> <laughs> well, another thing we're deeply grateful to you for is that you are the one who really prompted us as the USAID Alumni Association to take on the task of uh, finding a way to get an independent history of USAID's nearly 60 years of development experience. And I want to thank you for that, but I also want to ask you, why did you want to, why was that so important to you? Uh, I mean, you don't, you didn't need that for your own uh, gratification. I mean, this was uh, something you were really forceful about. And I think on this very stage is where you first exactly. mentioned that. <clears throat> well, I wanted to do it because of you, really and your colleagues around uh, uh, through the, the decades and the work you've done. I, I think that I'm, I, I love history. It's sort of my avocation, and I, I, I think it's important for societies and for families uh, to know who they are. Uh, and I, so I, I wanted to be sure that somehow or other we got recorded if not all the individual stories, though I hope a lot of them, uh, the, the, the story of this great effort we're all part of. I think later today we're going to be, we're going to be remembering <coughs> Peter Kim and John Sombrero, uh, who recently uh, just passed away, both of them, and who were such enormous contributors. <clears throat> but there are people like... Uh, uh, Peter and John in this room that so many of you that just made huge impacts on on pieces of the world and sometimes big pieces of the world uh, and uh, I hope you write your own stories for your own families uh, I really do hope that I, I I'm I'm doing my own actually on this but I think this is important and I think that you can draw some lessons I know we've got this uh, this author who is uh, writing and working hard at this, and I think we're going to see some lessons. You can look over uh, over the decades, and we'll see some things, some patterns, I believe. So, 
But uh, I started off, as I said, thinking that that uh, AID and its organizational chart is no more than that uh, until you put in the people uh, and you were, you were the organization and we need to have some lasting record of that. Wonderful, and I guess that now, in addition to reading the oral history, they can look forward to reading your own memoir. I thought that was what we were doing when we had that <laughs> oral history, but you're doing this in addition, that's well, great. Well, with my family and that kind of thing, it, it's great fun, because I've got, I've got seven brothers and sisters. So, I, so I've written my little piece of this, and I'm, I'm kind of getting all of them to put it together there. It's just a, but it's, we, we, need to re, we need to remember who we are and the people that, that uh, our sons and daughters and their our grandchildren and those. It's, it's amazing what they don't know about us. It's a little risky, isn't it? A <laughs> little risky to be well, asking you could, your siblings to contribute to this. Well, you know, you can put down what you want and what you don't want you leave out. <laughs> And all your, all your family can have fun with it. It is great fun. But, I, but organizations need this. This is a great organization. And at some point, it will be history. Uh, and, uh, and we did some wonderful things. And we need to have those down. And I, I know it, there'll, be, there'll be academic research. There'll be books, et cetera. And we need to have this together. All right, let me pick up one area that uh, I think is very important in AIDS history, and that is family planning. And I was fascinated by a discussion I heard at the Wilson Center a few years ago where they had six of the eight, I think it's eight, uh, six of the eight former heads of the population office in AID. And they were asked uh, which administrator was the most supportive and helpful to you and to a person, they said, you were. And that was really surprising to me because, of course, the Reagan administration is known for the Mexico City policy and other things. And so I think that is not only an extraordinary tribute to you, but I'm wondering how you pull that off. Uh, you know. <laughs> uh, well, in fact, during the Reagan years, in nominal dollars, uh, we provide more family planning than all previous administrations. Uh, the president uh, was supportive, certainly not opposed, as long as we were careful not to support in any way abortion. And, and we worked hard at this. There were some great battles. I, I don't, maybe something's wrong with me, but I've, I've enjoyed battles over the years, and this was, <laughs> this was probably the toughest sustained struggle for me within the Reagan administration, because on one hand, Jesse Helm thought IUDs were awful. We shouldn't fund those. Uh, and and the fam international family planning, family planning thought we were awful because uh, we didn't support abortions. And and uh, both were very intense. I remember driving down the street one day at K Street here and, and looking up and right in front of me with a big bus saying, McPherson kills women. Uh, I tried to get a copy of that sign. <laughs> I thought that would be a great memento. But because they were, they thought that it was awful because we weren't supporting abortion. We would never would have had Reagan support supporting abortion. That would have killed us. On the other hand, um, Senator Helms uh, withdrew uh, one of uh, one of the ambassadors close to Helms. Uh, took a took had an AID ad, uh, mission director sent home because he was too aggressive in Guatemala and supporting family planning. We made him head of Central America, by the way, <laughs> uh, because I I had to do that kind of stuff. Otherwise, but this was a. I was mentioning, but it was it was intense. I'll, I want to stop because there's too many long stories about this. But tell it, go ahead. Well, the, the one of the one of those one of the things I I didn't mention in this interview. I was thinking about it the other day that Alex did with me was in the middle of the intensity. Somehow or the other, through a close friend, I developed a relationship with Cardinal Kroll in Philadelphia. Now, those of you that remember a little bit about this. Kroll was very close to the Pope. 
uh, who was key in the Cold War. Remember, he was Polish, rest it. And Kroll was, had a, a real relationship with President Reagan. So when the, the Helms types were trying to get McPherson fired, which was a serious effort, I'm sure, uh, Cardinal Kroll wrote the president and said, McPherson's a good man, please support him. Uh, so this was the kind, and there was always maneuverings and back and forth, but all that, we got the money and we went forward. As I said, I, that was probably the most intense set of issues, but productive in, in outcomes. And, uh, and I didn't really mind. You know, the, I, one day, President called me, which he didn't do every day, I got to tell you that. I remember I, when he called, I jumped up. I was that. He always stood up when the president yeah, called. Yeah, call up. <laughs> this is my advice to you. Always call, stand up when the president calls you. Remember that. <laughs> Well, he didn't call very often, that's for sure. But he called up and he said, uh, Peter, I just got off the phone with Mother Teresa. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> and she's very interested in talking to you about family planning. My assistant has her number. So, of course, I call her up. And, you know, she, she was worried about whether, and I sat next to her at something later with, to introduce her on an award. And she said to me, uh, do you support the unborn? Yes, Mother Teresa. She said, write it down. Said, <laughs> I, I had this program, this little thing I was going to introduce you with, so I wrote down, to, I support the unborn. <clears throat> and she said, sign it. She's a nice lady, a nice lady, but she was <laughs> determined. Sign it. And so I signed it. And then I said, well, Mother Teresa, you should sign this for me too. So she signed it. And... Uh, my wife ran up afterwards and said, and I had this crumpled in my pocket, <laughs> and she said, give me that paper. This is forever. <laughs> so my, my kids have for years fought over who gets the Mother Teresa piece of paper. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, there were great fights. And there were, we, you know, you, you've got your individual stories like this, don't you? Your struggle, I mean, I, that's really true. The struggles where you, you couldn't, weren't quite sure you could make it work, and you had to maneuver, you had to fight. Uh, but we believed in things. It, there, was a, there was a sense at AID like I've never had any other place I've worked. This is really true. A sense of mission uh, of if we don't do it, it won't get done. Uh, the way to, it is a, uh, it's, it was a great place, it is a great place, I'm sure. Well, that's, you know, that sense of mission was obviously the people in charge of family planning and everything else understood that you conveyed that message. There's another area that's also in the kind of health-related area that I wanted to ask you about, and that was what you and Jim Grant managed to do with getting oral rehydration uh, therapy out into mass usage and how you did that and... Um, you know, how did you manage this life-saving initiative and in getting it moving with targets and all the rest? Well, uh, now Brady came to me with this. I think Ann Van Dusen, you were involved in not developing <laughs> that. You did it, developing this whole idea. Uh, the, uh, raise your hand, man. They all know you. Uh, <laughs> it, such a key player to all of us. Uh, and the Dyer Research Center in Bangladesh had this technology, but, but it, nothing was happening with it, really. Uh, and uh, Niall, uh, with his appropriate briefing, came to me, and Niall was a very good man. He's passed away, by the way, just recently. Uh, Niall argued this case, and, we, and it looked like a, like a, a good idea. Now, Jim Grant already had some involvement in this. He was mostly focusing on vaccination care. And so we began to think, how do we do this? Can we, what can we put together? And one of the, the big advantages I had was I had some wonderful people that were 20 years older or more than I was who were, who were really great mentors and advice givers. My old president at Michigan State, John Hanna, uh, who, who was administrator in the 70s. Uh, obviously, Jim Grant. Father Hesburgh was wonderful. Uh, Norman Borlaug. 
not in our business, but Elliot Richardson was just a wonderful guy to bounce problems off from. Uh, uh, but these, the, the development folks like Grant and Borlaug, uh, they quickly decided they could call up McPherson and give some advice. Often they wanted money <laughs> of projects, but they had good ideas. And Grant, and Grant uh, had this enormous capacity, his excitement and commitment to things to draw us in. And I remember having this dinner in Grant's apartment in New York. He was head of UNICEF at the time with Grant and Father Hesper, where we talked about how to do this. And, uh, and AID, then we had this international conference. You'll remember that, a thousand people from 60 countries. We saw we had a couple of them. And at the end of that first big conference, so that we, we uh, in the first big conference, Grant said, well, geez, Peter, this is a wonderful conference, but what's our commitment here? Uh, as I said, I continue to learn from Grant and so many others, what's our commitment here? So in the few hours, we put together a statement that said, uh, in I think three years, uh, by, the, by the third year, we would save three million lives a year. And uh, I talked to a number of people. Certainly, it wasn't a systematic consultation, but then, but sufficient, we thought. At the end of the conference, I stood up and said uh, that we're all here, consult itself. We're all here to have uh, to make the following commitment. And and it and we put a lot of resources in it, sometimes painfully because it would take money from other places. Uh, but that commitment was galvanizing. The idea, the concept, of course, was galvanizing. There's lots of stories about the individual successes. Uh, but uh, ORT is basically Gatorade, by the way. Uh, it's, a, it's a great success. And, uh, and AID, along with several other things, can be this was a concrete savings of millions of lives over a period of time. But this con this th this three million came out of consultation. Nowhere. Well, no, wait. no. But you look at the world. You look at the numbers. You look at the countries AIDs in. Uh, you look at at the capacity. I, it was a really a rough estimate, but it, it wasn't a number simply scrolling. Did Ann Van Dusen give you that number? <laughs> <laughs> but go ahead, Ann. Yeah, no. It's a lesson that I've learned and every that I learned there and done every time since. At Michigan State in a micro business comparatively, uh, I wanted to have study abroad be a big deal after and and uh, after consultation on campus, I I announced that we were going to have forty percent of our graduates have a study abroad experience by X year. And uh, some people on campus said, well, we've got to figure that all out before we announce it. Well, you've, by the time you figure it all out, you know, the, the year has come and gone. So you got to just make, be practical and throw the spear. And I think, and that's something I've learned. I saw in business. I saw, of course, in government, universities. Big, and, and of course, what we had here, uh, it, something that's, that's idealistic, that, that's, that's bigger than we are, uh, is important. A big goal that doesn't really impact things so what, but three million kids or something. One of the, I mean, are there, <clears throat> as you think about what you've worked on and what areas were highly important to you that maybe aid doesn't get involved in so much anymore, uh, I, I particularly want to point to the issue of participant training because everybody that you talk to in aid when they choose one area where they think they made the most impact was participant training. But what are your reflections on things that uh, aid um, maybe doesn't do so much anymore? Well, I think participant training is a huge deal. Uh, I thought it then, and we drove our numbers up from 7,000 a year to a high point of 18,000. 
uh, we did this by saying projects needed to either include participant training or tell us why not. You can imagine the impact that had on, immediately had an impact. Uh, but it, it um, and we're, they've, it, it began to go down sometime after I left and it's now just a couple thousand people, depending upon how you count it and so forth. It's a real mistake in my view. I, I, uh, but you know, you can't, we've moved more and more because of Congress, a bunch of things, to wanting measurable outcomes. And you can count a life saved. Child survival was a great political success. You can count a life saved, but it's harder to count the, the impact, economic, social, et cetera, of, of a person who goes back home. I think the same thing, we, we're not building institutions like we should, in my view. You gotta be careful, you spend too much money in institutional building, but, uh, but with technology you can do a lot. I, I think also the research is key too in the whole range of things. You know, the, the OR, ORT was a great, it wasn't, AID's capacity to mobilize was only possible because we had the technology. If you don't have the technology, often you can't get there. I, I would, uh, I think there needs to be greater reallocation to some of these not quickly measured outcome areas. So you wouldn't have given the Nobel Prize to uh, the most recent recipients of the, uh, on the economic side? Well, no, I think that they, there's some real value. I mean, I think that today we've got uh, data and, uh, and technology tools that let us better measure things, and some things should be measured, for sure. You better choose what you're measuring carefully because people respond to those. You better not make it so complex that nobody it doesn't get done, it falls by its own weight. Uh, but I think that, for example, I think the three million should have been measured. But I also think that that can get carried too far. I think they made a contribution. Okay, now I, was, I want the rest of you to make a contribution. I have lots of uh, questions for Peter that we could go on for several hours, of course, but the floor is now open to those of you, and uh, if there are microphones around, John Peelmeyer, and I can't see who's where, but, uh, and. Peter, I wanna, uh, happen to be working in your front office at one point when, as a, I'm sorry, it happened as a former dairy farmer, but you kind of eviscerated the USAID agriculture program because of the bumpers amendment. Could you talk about how what the pressures were to change our agriculture program and what that meant for our agriculture staff and program? Well, the, the history of the bumpers amendment, which prohibited us to do work that was going to directly compete with U.S. agriculture exports, uh, began primarily because, or a huge emphasis of this, was we helped uh, in a very major way, Brazil developed a soybean industry. And it took decades for people to forget that. Now, uh, I don't remember the particular dairy case, but we had to be careful uh, because there were people very excited, very upset about this. It, was, it wasn't like family, it wasn't like the fam abortion, but there were issues we had to work through in order to protect everything. Now I'm happy to say <clears throat> that, this would be back in the 80s of course, I'm happy to say that US agriculture uh, has, has moved away from being uh, uniformly unhappy about increased agriculture production in the developing world. Uh, there's a great case of years ago, we were exporting more grain to feed animals so people could eat the animals to Korea, then all the grain we gave to Korea after the Korean War. I mean, all the 
PL480. So there's, there's a market development going on. BIFAD just recently uh, delivered a report making the case for uh, investment in agriculture development abroad uh, by AID uh, as, uh, as important uh, for U.S. agriculture. Great. Anyway, I hope I wasn't too hard on you years ago. <laughs> John Wesley? I'm uh, John Wesley. I've always uh, Peter been a great admirer of yours. And I thought, actually, we had done fairly well in agriculture under you, which is one well, of the Well, I believed in it. That was for sure. <laughs> the two Johns ought to get together later and there sort that okay. out. <laughs> one thing I'm not sure that anybody remembers is that I remember you came out to visit us in the India mission, I think it was a program economist or something, and we made a tremendous case to you for trying to do something about the split between grants and loans. In the India program, the Indians wanted no loans, of course, and we were having a terrible time doing what we wanted to do is we built the program up again in India, uh, right. dealing with that. And I don't know what happened, but it wasn't too long before we no longer had that loan grant split. The loans were gone. Well, thank you for remembering that. Uh, there's grant money had enormous value uh, because you uh, you could get more change, more impact with grant money if you if you worked it. On the other hand, grant money uh, if you didn't work it carefully could be easily wasted. So, I, I think the India program wasn't very wasn't very large. Uh, but I think it was strategically doing some excellent things, as I recall. Other questions? Com yeah. so. Peter, you talk about the importance of anecdotes. Put the microphone history. close to your... You speak of the importance of anecdotes in history, and I want to share a personal anecdote related to you. You came in with a deep commitment to one-room schools. To what? To... One room schools. Yes. And in 1987, uh, accompanied by Malcolm Butler, I, this relatively junior officer, came to your office. Uh, I found it fascinating the two of you spent most of your time talking about the Peace Corps days, which was great. But you wanted uh, multi grade one room schools in El Salvador. This was during the time of the conflict. Yes. And I led a team, we went down. You weren't very happy with the results. We basically <laughs> told you that this was not the time. But I do want you to know that the best programs that I've been involved in were the Escuela Nueva, which was a multi-grade uh, multi classroom thing um, that was very, very successfully carried out in Guatemala, Nicaragua, Good Peru, for you. and elsewhere. Good for you. And I am totally in support now. Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yes. Uh, Peter, could you talk a little bit about the AOJ program? The, the administration program? of justice. The administration of justice program. Which which part of this? The democracy programs that got started for Latin America. Well, I I think that that there are. Uh, you're talking like in El Salvador? Yeah. Well, there was a... El Salvador had, and still has, unfortunately, a large number of, 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 of deep issues. And the effort to, to bring justice to some of the terrible things that were happening, uh, did happen, was very important. Uh, how you can do it, how you build the institutions to make that feasible. Uh, it was, a, was an issue, of course. Uh, how you build institutions to work in years ahead, court systems at work, for example, uh, prosecuting uh, offices and so forth. Uh, you do training, you try to educate, you try to have uh, nonprofit organizations in the country. Nonprofit organizations in countries often can have a huge impact, uh, and we use them a lot uh, broadly. 
I thought it was, was helpful, but of course we've all been disappointed at what's happened since. Uh, there were bad things happening on both sides of that war. Uh, there's, a, there's a story, it isn't directly, I don't think, uh, though I think we funded it from this justice uh, pot of money you discussed. Uh, one time Lane Kirkland called up and said uh, yesterday and the day before, uh, three labor union leaders in, El in San Salvador were assassinated. And we think there's gonna be more. Lane Kirk, a member of AFL-CIO. So, Peter, we want you to put guards on this group of people. So we, we, I talked to our lawyers, good, capable men, uh, who said, I don't think we can legally do this. Well, I thought if I have Lane Kirkland and probably Ronald Reagan behind me, <laughs> I didn't, I was, so I said, let me read the law. And being a lawyer, I presume that maybe I could, <laughs> I thought there was some ambiguity in this. <laughs> and we, and we put those, we, we put those guards on, we had them there within 24 hours and no more people were killed. The Kirkland group that he was worried about. Uh, how well these justice and democracy programs work needs continual assessment. Uh, and we have to make sure we don't spend huge amounts of money on, on these efforts uh, when, when we also need money for all the other programs in the ID. Is that responsive to your question? Yeah. You, you Peter did not get a chance to hear the first panel, of course, which was focused almost entirely on this subject, so, uh, but a relevant uh, uh, contribution to that. I, I, I wanted to ask you just to insert something here that it seemed to me that a lot of what you were able to accomplish was not only your relationship with the president, but with some of the president's key advisors. And I know you could tell stories for the rest of the day about your relationships with Jim Baker and others, but would you provide the audience with a few examples of how your ability to run aid effectively was dependent on the fact that you happened to be good colleagues and friends of people who were in high positions elsewhere in government? I think this was really key, actually. Uh, during the campaign, Ed Meese, who was a very senior person in the Reagan campaign, asked me to help plan the transition uh, for during the summer before, of course, the election. And I got to really know Ed, and he made me general counsel of the transition. Uh, so I worked closely with him through all that. And earlier, working for President Ford, I'd been kind of a deputy of Jim Baker in the Ford campaign of 76. So I knew these two key people who were really kind of the heads of the rival factions, if you will, in the White House. I, and they, they supported me on things again and again. And I, Mies could really, on things like this abortion issue, I, I must say, without a guy like Ed Mies, it would have been much harder to do the family planning. And Jim Baker, who I, and I've stayed in touch with these two men, of course. I remember that Stockman, that first, uh, their first budget go around. Uh, this was really an edge. This was kind of fun. So, so Stockman came back with his first budget pass back to, to AID and, and cut out family planning, hundred all the family planning money, every dime of it. So I thought, oh my God, what am I going to do here? So I call up my friend Baker and I say, Jim Stockman is going to take all this money away from us. What's your advice? And I said, I, I can go back and practice law, but I can't run a program that cuts out family planning the first few months. What This doesn't make any sense. And Baker said, oh, Peter, don't worry about it. Stockman doesn't care about family planning. He just wants your money. <laughs> uh, so just fight on the money. That's really what this is all about. Uh, it was good advice, for sure. And, in, and, uh, and we did pretty darn well on that budget pass back, actually. There was a... There was a big fight that first year. Uh, Stockman wanted to have a, uh, a riff of, uh, I think, 8% of, uh, 
of AID's people. And you, you all know what a riff, it was just torn us apart, just a <laughs> terrible thing. All so my well. question is, so what I said to Stockman, well, we can get X number, but let's do it over a period of time because there'll be retirees, we'll have turnover and so forth. And that, and that first year, Baker, or the president never did this again, but the president uh, took all the big issues and resolved them in the Oval Office. Well, the way I'm sure it worked for most, it worked this case, the Stockman and I are front, sitting in front of the president's desk at the Oval Office, bickering back and forth about how we do this. And, and I was insistent that we we're not gonna have a riff and told the president how it was gonna be awful. This, Mr. President, gotta make your program effective. Well, Stockman agreed, and so that was it. So we, we didn't have a riff, but those relationships to, I know that Baker and, and that Stockman knew about how my relationship with Baker and Reese. Do you want to tell the $15 million check, check story? Oh, it was great fun. You, I bet some of you remember our big check. It was, it was, yeah, it was $28 million, I think. 28? Whatever it was, it was $28 million. So uh, you remember that we couldn't reprogram money till, uh, Till we got the law changed to allow the reprogramming, but the the, the first months I found you know, there's some bad projects. There always are bad projects, right? But we couldn't change them. So I said, let's cut out some of this money and give it back to the treasury. Counterintuitive for <laughs> all your colleagues there. Let's cut out this money and give it back to the treasury. So we we pushed and pulled and got this. I, I do think it was 28, 23, whatever, 20, the, we got this money. And so we went to the White House, Jay Morris's idea was the check actually. We went to the, we went to the White House uh, and said, we want to give the president a big check. Uh, and, and Mike Deaver thought this was just a wonderful idea. And so we went this, by then it was spring, early spring, and we had this event in the Rose Garden, where I had this huge check, and the, I'm passing the president. Haig went, decided it was a great event to go to too. <laughs> it, was, it was great to have Haig there. So <clears throat> took this check. It was a front page of papers all over the country. And Reagan kept telling Stockman, why can't you get the rest of the government agencies to give back money? <laughs> I mean, geez, McPherson knows how to give back money. Why aren't you? I don't, What's wrong with the rest of these guys? Anyway. Good. Uh, Lex Riafel. Uh Thank you. Peter, Good I thought you. I heard you say, uh, eight, you say it is a great organization. I, I have to ask you, uh, you think Treasury is a great organization? And uh, if not, why? Well, I like Treasury, too, I have to tell you. The Treasury. The Treasury is a very different place. Uh, Treasury uh, doesn't have the same, it has a different mission. Uh, there's deep commitments to the U.S. financial system. There's no question about it. Uh, there's an idealism and a commitment about AID that's, that's quite unique in Washington. Peace and the Peace Corps has that same kind of sense, clearly. Uh, and it, uh, I, I often reflect how the time, my time in Peace Corps, this was the Alliance for Progress days, uh, you, uh, we felt we could change Latin America. Of course, it was, it was not quite true, but the Alliance did have a big impact. Uh, I, I do believe that, uh, that AID is special. The Peace Corps has the same kind of, kind of uh, idealism, but without the opportunity for the professionalism and really the huge impact that AID can have. Yes, uh, Larry Garber. Peter, I wonder if you can uh, talk a little bit about conditionality, uh, both uh, when you were in the administrator, but also as you've seen it evolve over the last uh, decades. 
whether it's conditionality on corruption issues, human rights issues, or even just politics, you know, uh, whether we like a government or not, and whether you think it should be part of the decision-making process in terms of determining who receives assistance or not? Well, AID never was involved in conditioning money uh, upon a country doing an investigation. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, now, will you sign that? <laughs> if you'll sign it too. So, now we were, as you all know, pretty deeply involved in conditionality. And I think, uh, in a sense, aid agencies are always to some degree have conditionality because they say we're going to fund this and we're not going to fund that. Uh, but ours was much more direct where we had a series of things <laughs> that we said, if we're going to give you this money, we need to have you do this and that. I think that, uh, I think that there are lessons to be drawn here, some of which we utilize, some of which we probably could have done more of at AID. But I think you need to, you need to have a country have at least within its population or body politic a commitment to do what you want to do. Uh, we, otherwise, it won't, a, a change won't be sustained. If they only do it to get paid, uh, then they'll stop doing it the moment they're not paid. On the other hand, if you can, if you can, uh, if there's a, a group in a country that supports it, the Ministry of Finance or Agriculture, that kind of thing, I think you can, I think you can overdo it. I think that uh, I like, I think the MC, MCI has added something here of real value. I'm not sure that shouldn't have been part of AID. In MCC. Some way. MCC, excuse me. Could, could uh, uh, but I, I, I don't think, I think conditionality has a real place here. Right. Uh, my name's Ray Martin. Uh, former health population nutrition officer. We're very grateful for your support. And I'm glad, thanks Alex for asking Peter that question. Uh, Peter, you did mention uh, the interaction you had with Mother Teresa. I wanna ask a question about interaction with, uh, from the other end of the political spectrum. I think probably here the backstop 50 people remember the article Condoms from Ronnie, published by Playboy, which pointed out that despite all the rhetoric at that time and what people would think about the Reagan administration's support for family planning, there were actually more condoms going to developing countries under the Reagan administration than any of the previous administrations right. did. Right. So my question is, did you read that article? And if you did, <laughs> what was your reaction to it? <laughs> Well, we probably would have preferred it be done another forum. <laughs> but I, I, I think that uh, I've talked a lot about what I support, or so on and so forth. But I, there's there's many things here we need to give President Reagan some real credit for. There's no question, because I couldn't have done this if Reagan had had not been neutral or pro. And let me give you a story that uh, you remember the UN Family Planning Agency uh, that, uh, that we had problems with in this country because the 10 million that UNFPA was giving China uh, was being supporting the one child, one family. It was data that they were gathering. That 10 million was part of that project. And so, this is the question, we're going to stay in or stay out. I got Jim Buckley to at least defer his opposition. We he was a, then senator from New York? Or? Uh, he was the undersecretary. Oh, he was already undersecretary. And anyway, we get, but, but we had to work this out. So, using the, using the head of UNFPA as our negotiator, 
uh, we, we went to the president and said, uh, would you support staying in UF, can we stay in UNFPA if we get the Chinese to allocate our 10 million to child survival? And the president said, fine. And, and Bud McFarlane and I, who were part of this, then, then uh, National Security Council, uh, felt that Reagan would have supported the 10 million allocation if it was only going to condoms. Uh, that was never explicitly nailed down, but that we felt that we could get that if we, we needed it. Well, the Chinese just totally blew us off. They said, you know, we're not, we're China, we're not going to be, you either give us the money, we deal with it the way we're not, or we're not, we're not going to be controlled by political consideration in the United States. Anyway, that's what they thought. But I, I tell that story because there was, there was a president almost certainly willing to spend $10 million in condoms in China uh, to, to preserve our participation in UNFPA. Now, so he didn't make speeches about that, but when you got a, got a president like that, that meant I, I had to be very careful about abortions. But if I got a president like that on this issue, there's room. Woody. Uh, Woody Peter, thank you for your support. Wait for the mic. Peter, thank you for your support over the years for agriculture overseas, uh, particularly m marrying U.S. land-grant universities with international agricultural right. research stations. Uh, we're facing unprecedented times with climate change. Too much rain, not enough rain, water tables dropping, um, farmers in Africa really trying to figure out what to do. Um, but over the years, like, like in democracy, one and done doesn't happen in, in agriculture. Every year the, the pests right, change, exactly. the soils change. Where are we now in terms of getting U.S. support for international agriculture, particularly in light of the countries themselves really not supporting their international agriculture centers very well? Well, I, don't, I think we're no better than mediocre. Uh, the AID uh, supports the centers. It's about 25, 30 million a year, depending on how you allocate it. Uh, they're supporting what used to be called CRISP, but are now labs, development labs at 55 million. Uh, my organization, APLU, works hard at those numbers. That's why I know them precisely. Uh, but I think, and, and the... Uh, the Food Security Bureau is much bigger and much more more resources than it had uh, when the the spike in world food prices of 2007 got the world's attention, uh, and so the banks and development agencies are spending more money, but but not enough in my view, and <clears throat> and I think a, an important component of this. It's not the whole thing, but I, uh, I would look to the human resources and I'd look through technology. There's some, just with, it's, it's interesting when you look at research today as opposed to 30 years ago, let's say, we now have the tools, the information technology tools to do a lot more faster. Uh, and health is, is Great, they're spending all this money on NIH and agriculture and so forth. We, there's a capacity to do many, many billions more effectively with enormous return. Let me give you a project I saw sitting down with some faculty in Berkeley a couple months ago. Uh, Berkeley has a sizable plant research effort. You remember from high school biology what photosynthesis is? where the sun and leaves produces energy. Well, the work at Berkeley and University of Illinois suggests we can get like 20% more effective photosynthesis uh, impact on at least some crops. And I, I think in five years or more, maybe, we're going to have corn and wheat and some major crops, rice, have... Uh, 
influence, suppose you got six, seven foot corn now, what if it were 10 foot corn and much bigger ears and this kind of stuff. And it was really energy from the sun and it didn't cost you more money to get the energy like it costs now. There's a, so I continue to be pretty deeply involved in these international ag issues and, uh, and I don't think enough money is there. But take the general point that because of the tools we have now, uh, the research dollars in health, in energy, in agriculture have a quicker, bigger payoff in general than they did 10, 15 years ago. Okay, we have time I'm all for, into this, as you can right. tell. We have time for one more question. Barbara? I think mine is more compliments for Peter. I think that, um, uh, of course, I was working, and then Peter was responsible for me being on the Hill, actually, for a year. Mm -hmm. and um, But it really, his being there, the length of time. And I, I couldn't that, hear the who. I'm sorry. The length of time you were, were here as administrator made a big difference in our relationship with the Hill, because you had long, you know, uh, term experience, and you were able to develop those relationships, and I think they were some of the best that we had, you know, frankly, over the years, because of the fact that you were, you know, heavily involved in those relationships, and over an extended period of time, and after that, we'd have administrated for like a year or two for a period, and I think that really made a big difference. The other thing um, that I remember very specifically is that after you went to Treasury, as deputy secretary, I got a call from a friend from Treasury and who said, your, your former boss is just stopping in at people's offices at night and, you know, and sitting down, putting his feet up and asking questions. And I said, but that's what Peter has always done. <laughs> and, but it, it showed the difference, I thought, what you were talking about in terms of the agencies. Treasure was an old line agency, and people weren't used to right. having the, you know, the key right. people come down to their subordinates. And you know, for Peter, that was never an issue. You know, uh, I remember one time you were on a trip or something, and you called the op center, and they reached me, and I couldn't believe it. And he was like, it was a question on something you know, far different. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, and my boss didn't know about it, and, but that was okay. I told him later, but it was, um, but that was very much you. And I think it made such a difference in the cohesion of USAID during that period. And I, I really do appreciate that. Actually, that's a wonderful way for us to end this session. Uh, thank you, Peter McPherson, for all you have done, all you continue to do. Well, I mean, a lot of us are, are retired uh, and uh, no, just pushing pencils around in, in our homes. But here you are, you're not as old as I am, but you are doing all these things and leading the Oplu, and it's just wonderful, and we thank you for that. Do you want to have a last comment? Well, I think you were about to give to nicely clap. I think we all, all clap ourselves for all the good work we've done. How's that? Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. This is good. There are four unscripted public service announcements. Please. Number one, most importantly, something that is not on the agenda, very special event of Lifetime Achievement Awards, and that means that we need to return from lunch no later than 12.45, no, 1.45, please. In response to questions I've received, number one, Terry Myers is here, sitting over there. If there are any of you who have not yet signed the letter of support and would like to, please direct yourself to him. Number two, Rose Rockus has an interest, any of you with an idea of joining the mentoring programs, whether it's the ongoing, the new mission director, deputy mission director programs, or the Payne Fellows, 
Please contact Rose over lunch. Let's see, one, two, three, four. In response to the fourth question, um, the American University Archives information is a handout on the front desk, so please help yourself or go to our website. We will see you back at 1.45. Thank you. We have, we have a very special presentation today, and I'm going to turn it over to Betty Cook, who is going to take it from here, um, and you'll just hear what she has to say. Hi, everyone. You can hear me but not see me, right? Okay, that's good. I hope everybody had a good lunch. As, as both uh, Nancy said just before lunch, this is a very special uh, recognition, and I'm glad all of you are here to see it. Um, first, we have, let me just tell you what we do have here. We have um, the, the UAA board decided that Two of our late um, USAID friends and colleagues have achieved so much in their lifetime that we wanted to recognize them with a Lifetime Achievement Award. That would be Peter Kim and John Sambrello. I'm sure all of you recognize those names. We're lucky today to have with us their wives, uh, both Grace Kim and Cecilia, Sambrello that will receive the awards, and the awards will be presented by um, Dave Liebson, who was a very good friend of the Kims for about 30 years, I believe, right? Uh, John was a, um, a boss and a mentor for Dave, and they remained that, kept that friendship even after retirement and are still good friends to this day. So we wanted someone who knew them well to do these special uh, recognitions. So we've asked Dave, and he was very happy to uh, join us today. So he's going to first talk a little bit about um, Peter Kim's achievements during his life, and then we'll have Frank do this with John Sambrello. So let's welcome Dave up here. Thank you. I'm one of about, I think, 20 people that would have liked to have done this, so I'm quite honored and humbled. Uh, Peter, as I think most of you know, was director of AIDS Office of Housing and Urban Programs for uh, better than 30 years. Um, that program, uh, was a remarkable program. It leveraged private sector resources, loan resources, uh, and for support of low-income housing and slum improvement around the world. Um, over, the, over those years, the program that Peter managed and put together and really built um, reached more than 30 million people. Big number. Did that both directly through uh, houses, and home improvements and home building uh, that was financed through by on loans from U.S. capital markets uh, uh, and also indirectly through neighborhood improvements, infrastructure, schools, water that were also financed by funds raised on U.S. capital markets. So leveraging both aid technical assistance with capital markets. Um, how did he get 30 million people? That's a lot. How many of us can say we did 30 million of anything? Um, first of all, and I'll steal something from Peter McPherson. He, I, I think the truth is Peter liked a battle. He liked fighting for things that were important. Uh, and uh, so that was, I, my humble opinion, that was maybe the most important thing he did. But more importantly, from an aid point of view, he directed these private sector resources. Uh, he inherited a program that was largely middle-income housing, and he redirected it to focus on the poor, focus on the financial institutions, uh, to carry that on out and focused on the policies that local governments and national governments needed to adopt to make those programs more sustainable. That's how he, he reached 30 million people. Um, he also focused on building a team around him. Uh, he recruited terrific people. And more importantly, I think he gave us, I was one of those people that Peter mentored, he gave us remarkable amounts of authority 
to uh, go out and negotiate with the highest levels of the governments they were working in on policies and programs. Uh, we were never, it, we were always trying to find where they wanted to do something that overlapped with what we, from a policy point of view, were trying to encourage, uh, and then take that middle and try to uh, find ways to fund things that would accomplish those goals. Peter was a remarkable guy. I've, of those of us that he mentored, uh, many have gone on to very senior positions, both inside and outside the agency. We currently count the counselor of the agency as one of Peter's graduates, uh, the, for, the past pre vice president of the uh, Millennium Challenge Corporation was a graduate, and I think by my count there are at least 10, if not more, uh, of us who went on to be mission directors within the agency or CEOs, presidents of major nonprofit organizations. Uh, but a lot of that came from Peter, both the mentoring of how to fight a battle, how to win a battle, uh, or at least fight it, even if you don't win it. Um, but even more importantly, again, something Peter McPherson noted was he imbued in us, like many of you, um, a real passion. We all really felt we were working on something very important. Urban and housing was never mainstream in development think. Uh, but we all knew, and Peter was the first to point out, you know, a lot of poor people on the countryside, but they're moving to the cities, folk. We got to do something about that. And there are ways to manage it. There are things that can be done. And that's what we focused on. Uh, so Peter was a real remarkable guy for all of us. Uh, just want to note, Peter uh, uh, fought during the Korean War. He was uh, uh, led a combat co construction platoon. He rose to the rank of Master Sergeant uh, when they finished. Um, in response to, Peter and Grace were both involved in a lot of uh, 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 advocacy for civic things back in those days, and in response to uh, the Kennedy's sort of asked what you can do for your country, uh, Peter and his brother Vic, who was here with us, uh, joined a kind of uh, Peace Corps-like nonprofit program first here in the U.S., and then they took their then families with, I think there were, what, seven kids or four, a bunch of kids uh, off to Mexico <laughs> um, uh, and uh, did very much Peace Corps-like work there. Uh, Peter afterwards went to work for the AF of LCIO, A-Field, uh, where uh, he, he, and Vic, I don't remember if you were part of this or not, but put together housing programs for A-Field in Latin America, and that led to uh, uh, an invitation to, uh, to then be, join aid. As I say, when Peter came into aid, the housing guarantee program that was the bread and butter uh, was then largely devoted to um, basically middle income housing built by American builders. And Peter very soon recognized the need to shift that focus to the poor, to focus it to uh, local construction capabilities to the local institutions that could finance these things. There are those that say that Peter uh, is the father of the savings and loan industry in Latin America uh, through the kinds of programs that got initiated there. Uh, he, as I say, he joined aid in 1966. Uh, after his service of the, with the Office of Housing, uh, he went on. He was a deputy, deputy assistant administrator in the old Environment Center. Uh, he then became the director of the U.S.-Asia Environmental Partnership and then eventually retired. Even when he retired, he wasn't done. Uh, he helped found something called the International Housing Coalition, which advocated uh, for the internationally uh, to, for the kinds of programs that aid was doing then. Um, there have been lots of awards uh, too many to go through here, but I thought I'd just call out two that I think Peter was particularly proud of and certainly illustrate what he was accomplishing. In 1991, President Reagan uh, gave him the presidential rank of distinguished executive. This, as I understand, is the highest award that uh, is possible in the senior executive service. So that's for management, that's for causing things to happen. Uh, and at another whole level, so what does it all matter? Uh, in 1966, at the United Nations in New York, Peter was in, in, uh, inscribed on their uh, scroll of honor, uh, honoring him for 30 years 
of astounding service to the needs of the poor and for helping developing countries meet the challenges of rapid urbanization. Uh, the Alumni Association is giving him this award uh, of a, a achievement, a lifetime achievement, uh, in recognition of uh, the long uh, line of things he's done for the agency and for the poor around the world. Peter was born in New York in 1929, and he passed away on March 30 this past year. Peter, uh, Peter's wife Grace is here. Also want to acknowledge Victor Kim, uh, who's sitting in the front row, P v Peter's brother, and Christopher Kim, Peter's, uh, uh, one of Peter's sons, also here with us. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and with that, we want to uh, turn it over. I do want to note that Grace herself uh, is a very important person in her own right for a long time advocacy on the uh, programs for the poor, the environment, women's health, lots of great things. So this, this belongs to Grace as well as Peter. Give me a moment before Grace says a few words to read the citation which uh, we just presented to Grace on John's behalf. This is the Lifetime Achievement Recognition presented to Peter M. Kim for the years of distinguished service, vision, dedication, and commitment to the principles and ideals of the USAID Alumni Association, the U.S. Agency for International Development, and the country on this date, October 25, 2019. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to thank Al Shackow especially for bringing us all together and keeping us all together. I think Pete really, he, he got a lot of awards, but he would really, really appreciate this one because he thought this was the wonderful group and uh, he did a lot of good work, but he could not have done it without all these good people. They were just amazing and prepared and educated and dynamic. But, and Peter McPherson was our leader, so he could do anything. So thank you guys and uh, keep up the good work. Okay, so I'll go back to my seat and I sit here. Okay. Sorry. Oh, I, we're just, forgive us, we're going to get this logistically straightened out. <laughs> okay, the next on the agenda is to recognize uh, John Sambrello and his wife Cecilia is here. Frank Almaguer jumped at the chance to make this presentation. He and um, and John have been friends for 36 years through both USAID and the Pan American Development Foundation, and they've maintained that friendship over the years with much affection. Frank? Good afternoon. Um, as always, uh, Peter McPherson is an inspiration, uh, and he mentioned that in his career, and he has done many things, he did not find anywhere else the kind of spirit and commitment that we find uh, in the USAID uh, environment. And so in this fantastic group of highly talented individuals, it is really very difficult, very challenging to identify one or two people who just stood out uh, among so much talent. And uh, the USAID Alumni Association has done a terrific job uh, by recognizing two of our giants, uh, Peter Kim and John Sambrello. As Betty said, I, I have known, I knew John for some 36 years. There's several of you around here. I see Norma Parker and others who uh, knew him far longer than that. Now, we all remember John for his enormous contributions to the development profession. 
started as a Peace Corps volunteer in the late 1960s in Venezuela. And again, I was very pleased this, this morning to hear Peter McPherson talk about the influence that Peace Corps had on him uh, in his early service. Then he came over to us USAID, where he served for almost 30 years, <clears throat> including serving a mission, as mission director five times. I'm not sure if that's a record, but it's darn good. Uh, then he went to work for the um, Pan American Development Foundation, an entity financed and supported by the Organization of American States. And I can recount uh, the story of that engagement, but let's, let's just say that when, when he arrived, it was devoid of money, uh, it was exiled into another building uh, far away from the OES, OES headquarters. And when he left, his annual budget was higher than the budget that I managed at the OES for the institution. Uh, it's an example of his capacity to draw resources to do that which he was so passionate in doing. And of course, the other thing that he did for, for all of us was to help shape the development priorities so that AID could remain current to the existing needs as opposed to the legacy kinds of programs that we often love but may not necessarily be as relevant as, as, uh, as time goes by. And for those of us who have uh, a long history with Latin America, uh, we have to mention this strong passion for Latin America, obviously started in, in Venezuela, gone, and his passion for Ecuador was, is well known, beginning with his wife, Cecilia. Um, I don't see Clarence Savekas here, but Clarence Savekas has assured me that he is the one who brought you together. So, uh, and his, his entire life was devoted to promoting good governance, and sound economic policies wherever he served, and in whatever capacity he served. And, and to add to his multiple achievements as a development professional, um, we have to highlight his pioneering work in the history of international development. And Alec and others here know uh, uh, of his efforts to not only record the history which is now being done uh, by the association, but also to help us understand that foreign aid is not just a creature of the creation of USAID in 1961, or even the Marshall Plan before that, but rather as far back as the beginnings of this nation, uh, the founding fathers uh, began the first foreign aid programs, not called that way, but there were humanitarian reasons and there were foreign policy objectives that have been pursued over the years, and nothing excited him as much as being able to discuss exactly what uh, the Camera Commission did in Latin America in the 1920s. Uh, so he, uh, uh, his, his love for, for this history uh, was uh, captured. I, I, I want to recognize Bob Jordan, who is way in the back. Uh, but Bob has been uh, a, a godsend for the Sombrero family. Uh, in, the, in the last uh, few uh, years of, of a difficult uh, situation for, for both John and Cecilia. And uh, I asked them, you know, tell me a little bit about uh, the many times that you uh, engaged with John as he was going back and forth on I-95 uh, to Baltimore to be treated at Johns Hopkins University. And he mentioned something that I had never heard of, but in one of those conversations, John was excited to talk about the, the, the Philippine counterpart of the Marshall Plan. Uh, I had never heard of the Philippine Rehabilitation Act of 1946, but, but uh, despite uh, all of the other challenges he faced, he was excited to talk about this, this uh, uh, activity that went on that I, you know that most of us uh, forget. Uh, and so he... Um, he, he was just animated, and I know that I personally, and, and others did as well, would read and reread some of his drafts, um, wondering if anyone would be interested, but no, he just loved the concept that foreign aid is part of the American DNA. 
Uh, and the other thing is that John, uh, long before, as we discussed this morning, long before USAID was engaged in the issue of democracy and governance, uh, John talked about this. And he was committed to the idea that we have certain values and objectives and that our society is, is um, the democratic society, society that it is because we have open markets, open economies, and free people thrive in those environments. And so that's exactly what John would attempt to do in every one of the posts in which he served. Um, and let me also uh, add and, and conclude that uh, everyone who worked with him, and there are many people here, can attest and, can, and tell tales of John's uh, countless hours at work. Uh, Cecilia, thank you very much for making him available. But 16-hour um, days, seven days a week was, was, was normal. Now, he, um, he expected others to contribute. And I think everyone would agree that he was a tough taskmaster but he never expected anything of anyone else that he was not prepared to do and engage in. Uh, he, his commitment was a very personal one, and he wanted all of us to succeed, uh, and he led the way. Uh, he uh, obviously was a mentor to many of the individuals who are here uh, this afternoon, and those of us who fall in that category, we're very thankful to John for not only mentoring us, but having this very strong professional and personal influence uh, and to be guided by him. Uh, nothing better than to seek uh, John out on issues and ideas that we were thinking about. So um, this uh, brilliant man, this brilliant public servant, uh, like, like in the case of Peter Kim, uh, made life much better for countless millions and particularly in the Latin America region, but within the AID community as well. So uh, because of his enormous contributions, again, thank you, Cecilia, for sharing John with us. Uh, and on behalf of the, of the USA Alumni Association, uh, I'm delighted to be honored to present this award to Cecilia, well, a lifetime achievement award or recognition presented to John Sambrello via Cecilia. Hope you will understand my, language, my accent now, Ecuadorian accent. To all of you who were friends and congress of Jan, sorry I'm very sentimental and still too sensitive. Put the microphone. <laughs> Is it on? Okay. Thank you for coming today to honor him. A special thanks to the USA Alumni Association and to you, Frank, for all your kind words and for organizing this very meaningful ceremony. It's been a great comfort in my sorrow. I deeply appreciate all of, of your thoughtful expressions of love, friendship, and respect for Jan's life, as well as your recognition of his work. I would also like to thank you very much for this beautiful plaque, plaque which I will gratefully treasure it in my heart and in my memory. Jan truly enjoyed working for you, USAID and was very proud of the work all of you performed. You helped him accomplish his goal to change the lives of the, most, the less fortunate people in Latin America and the Caribbean. Without your support, he would never have achieved this and would be successful in his career. You were all a big part of his life. Thank you. Let's have a round. Let's have a round of applause for all of our our honorees, their families, and the presenters today. On, on behalf of the UAA board, thank you.
Now I have the pleasure of introducing to you the new de deputy, well, not so new, months, sorry, Deputy Administrator Bonnie Glick. Um, given that we only have in half an hour, Bonnie, if I could just say a couple of sentences, please join us. How are you? Since you have full biography, what I wanted to do was just highlight a couple of points. One is that uh, Bonnie started her career with Department of State and served in some of our parts of the world, Ethiopia and Nicaragua, I guess it was, and she survived. <laughs> On a more personal note, our paths crossed several years ago when we both worked for IBM Consulting. There will be remarks, please, and then hopefully time for a round or two of, of questions. Okay. Thank Sounds you. Good. Thanks, Nancy. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and thank you all for being here today. Thank you for sticking it out for a long day and not heading over to Nats Park. Uh, looks like the, there's traffic congestion that's already beginning, and we're all really excited about it uh, here in Washington. Uh, I have some semi-prepared remarks, but I also thought that I would just share some overall insights. Nancy said, I'm the new deputy administrator, that I am the newest, um, and, and there's a whole lot more knowledge in this room uh, of the agency and the importance of the different aspects of the work that we do than I'll ever have. Uh, so with that understanding, thank you, and thank you for your willingness overall to share that with us. It's great to see friends in this room, friends with whom I've served uh, both in the State Department as well as uh, as a debate coach. Hey, Larry. Um, Thank you for your continued interest in USAID. For us in the agency, there's comfort in knowing that you're out there and that you're interested in the continued and longstanding success of USAID. And it's a comfort to us to know that we can come to you and take advantage of some of your knowledge and your institutional memories. You all are already familiar with the big organizational transformation that we're undertaking at USAID the first time that something significant of this size has been done in about 20 years. And it's now headed into the next chapter, which is implementation. And that's probably harder and hairier and stickier and all of that. But I didn't want to come here and rehash that because this uh, conversation today around democracy and democratization is what we talk about all the time at USAID. We always have, and until we see democracy reigning all over the world, we'll continue to do so. So we talk about what's at stake in the 21st century. The 21st century is the century of a competition for ideas, the relationship between citizens and their governments China wants a world that looks like China. We want a world that the countries in which we're operating aspire to. You've heard about the journey to self-reliance, our vision that everything that we do should be aimed at the day when there's no longer a need for foreign assistance, where every single day we walk alongside our partner countries and help them reach their goals, their aspirations. We are here today to talk about rights and freedoms. And so I think I'll talk about a few of them as they relate to USAID today. Much of it hasn't changed. The first freedom of the Bill of Rights is the freedom of religion. And Jefferson put it right up front because he recognized that freedom of conscience is the freedom that makes all other freedoms possible. Unfortunately, it's under increasing pressure today from mass shootings in synagogues, in churches, in mosques, to Russia's purges of Jehovah's Witnesses, to the ethnic cleansing of Burma's Rohingya population, to China's imprisonment of millions of Uyghurs and other ethnic and religious minorities. It's often said that the truest measure of devotion to religious freedom is how hard we work to protect it for other people. 
Today at USAID, we're working it hard to do just that because there are so many situations where we cannot successfully fulfill our own mission, whether that's feeding people who are hungry, strengthening democratic institutions, or nurturing economic growth without addressing the causes that underlie religious tensions. For example, we'll never be able to restore the once beautiful and vibrant mosaic of communities in northern Iraq, which ISIS came within in inches of exterminating, without building the kind of tolerance necessary for peaceful coexistence. The only way to tackle it is at its core. The second freedom-related area where we've poured renewed resources is electoral democracy. The internet, social media and other new technologies have not always turned out to be the great democratizers that we had hoped for as recently as five or ten years ago. Authoritarians, it turns out, are pretty good at manipulating the internet to subvert challenges to their rule. And these authoritarians often have help from malign actors in Russia, in China, in Iran, in Venezuela, and in Cuba, who are too happy to either pay off journalists or send zombie election observers or otherwise subvert the development of a healthy civil society. We've had to adapt programming accordingly, not just for election days, but for the whole election cycle by improving the quality and rigor of evaluations and metrics and developing a whole new set of tools under our new Bureau of Development, Democracy, and Innovation, which will be called DDI. Going forward, we'll be elevating and better integrating the Office of Democracy, Human Rights, and Governance throughout USAID's programming. I could go on on this for some at some length, but we're in the process of institutionalizing now, and DDI should be stood up formally in some time. Not quite sure how quickly the wheels of government will turn to make that happen, but we'll be releasing more information on it as it gets much closer to the date. The third dimension of freedom that I want to highlight involves a connection that not everyone grasps intuitively. But private sector engagement is at its core an acknowledgement that the days of government to government development assistance are mostly over. Government does not have the money and we certainly don't always have the expertise to provide meaningful financing to all of the countries that are now embracing the philosophy that private enterprise is the most powerful engine ever devised for lifting people out of poverty. More than 90% of investment flows into emerging economies are from the private sector, and our role is not to compete with it. Our role is really to get out of the way. When I talk about private sector engagement and the critical need for us to support both local private sectors as well as engaging with the American private sector, I hearken back to those two aspects of my career. I started in the State Department and I left to go into private industry. At AID, the Agency for International Development, we talk about developing countries. Those same exact countries are called emerging markets by businesses. We talk about aid beneficiaries. They talk about customers and clients. And I would have to say that there's probably no mother who ever aspires that her daughter or son become a refugee. They always want their children to become consumers. All of these people have one thing in common, that they're endowed by their creator, I didn't write this, uh, with certain unalienable rights, but the most important of those rights is dignity. And I guess you could probably quibble over how you refer to it, but to my mind, the fundamental freedom of access to markets and access to a better future is an important and critical freedom for us to foster and promote in the agency. Belief in human dignity is why we at USAID are changing from talking about beneficiaries to talking about partners 
and we're talking about empowered young people. The future is theirs. And after all, did we want those young people to be beneficiaries or do we want them to be stable consumers? The language that we use reflects an underlying mindset. And it can make a big difference in how the people you're talking with think about themselves and think about the trajectory of the countries in which they live. This focus on human dignity is also why uh, Administrator Green undertook to set up the Action Alliance for the Prevention of Sexual Misconduct, which I have the honor to lead. It's hard work. It's hard work transforming the culture of our industry where for too long people have been able to act in a culture of impunity in which predators have jumped from one organization to another, staying one step ahead of accountability. We're changing that into a culture of personal responsibility, one in which every person who works at aid or with aid, whether they're an aid foreign service officer, civil servant, foreign service national, third country national, contractor, or grant employee, one in which all of us understands and accepts that it's our obligation to help prevent sexual misconduct and to act decisively if we become aware of it, no matter where we are. Because it's also true that there's not one person, however humble their job description might be, who can't make a difference simply by taking a stand on this very important matter. The people we're serving all over the world are the most vulnerable people very often. We cannot let sexual harassment, sexual exploitation, and abuse be something else that they have to worry about. It's on us to worry about it and to root it out. We're also striving to live by example, ensuring that our programs and policies are inclusive of all people, including the LGBT community, and to draw on the skills and contributions of all people in both our workplace and in our programming. Our partners, country partners, implementing partners, and the others we work with rightly look to USAID to set a tone of tolerance and inclusion in the development space, particularly in societies that are non-accepting. The landscape of these issues has changed, and it's incumbent upon us to change with it and support the basic human dignity of everyone we work with and everyone we serve. So I'm going to wrap up here. I do think we have time for a couple of questions that I'm happy to take, but I really want to just thank you. I inherited the agency that all of you built, and I'm grateful for it. It's an honor to serve at USAID. It's, honor to work, it's an honor to work with the professionals who are there, both here in Washington and around the world. I'm taking off on Tuesday for my first trip to Asia, and I'm looking forward to meeting with everybody uh, in four different uh, countries, Vietnam, Thailand, Bangladesh and Indonesia, uh, and to meet with the staff and our missions in those countries as well. So for now, thank you. Thank you for all that you have done, and thank you for all that you have committed to continue doing moving forward. Thank you. Yes, please. And what I'd love is if you can say your name and where you last served. Bill Anderson, gee, uh, last served Eritrea during the border war. Okay, very good. Um, you, uh, your your uh, comment about government to government aid is mostly over is correct, but there is this group of fragile states, and uh, in, in I think one to two decades, a large proportion, large majority of the extreme poor will be there, mm -hmm. and so. I think that's probably a group of states that will will uh, continue to receive a large amount of government to government aid. And one of the most important problems, at least uh, paraphrasing Paul Collier and the bottom billion, is no growth, and therefore not enough jobs. Mm -hmm. That's just one of them. Mm -hmm. So I just wondered about. Go, thank you. 
So um, the question is about fragile states, and uh, the comment is that those will certainly continue to be the ones who receive government-to-government -government assistance. We do distinguish, as you know, between development assistance and humanitarian assistance, and the U.S. is never going to um, – to not be committed on the humanitarian space. That's, that's a natural place for us to play. USAID is the main actor in the US government in the humanitarian realm and certainly in these fragile states. So I appreciate the comment very much. Thank you. Yes, please. I'm sitting here with Kier To, and we hear that you're going to Thailand, I am. which we've considered self-reliant for low these many years. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to ask about the journey to self-reliance in the context of a country like Thailand. That's awesome. OK, so Thailand is a perfect example of the journey to self-reliance and USAID's partnership. You are right. Thailand is a self-reliant country. I'm going to Thailand because it's where the Indo-Pacific Business Forum is being held this year, where I'm going to talk about the other countries in the Asia region that where we do focus and with a heavy sector on private sector uh, heavy focus on private sector engagement, because Thailand is what everyone aspires to be, a country that can stand on its own. Uh, and perfect, perfect setup. It's like I, I planted the question. Um, but it's critically important to the Indo-Pacific Business Forum, which is a partnership with the US Chamber of Commerce, to meet with business leaders across the ASEAN region to talk about uh, investment and infrastructure and the digital economy and energy. And when we have those conversations, they start sometimes to be very clear and sometimes to get a little bit muddy. And the muddiness comes in when we talk to governments or we talk to businesses, mostly ministries of ICT, who hem and haw and look at their shoes and uh, wonder when I'm going to get to the point about China. And it does go back to the competition for ideas and for democracy and for free society, as well as acknowledging that the United States doesn't have a monopoly on all of the good ideas. And there are lots of options out there. Uh, but the Chinese government does have a monopoly on the way it encourages people to think. And that is the distinction between us. So it, previewing a lot of what's, what's to come when I'm in Bangkok. Thanks so much, Mike. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, Jim Beaver, my last job was at LPA. Right. And that's my hiking buddy right there, Tom Stahl. Uh, He's my neighbor. Yeah. <laughs> uh, two questions. One is, in your time so far with the agency and as you take your trip, um, first is leadership. And by that I mean development of the leadership, talent, and, scape and capability of our own American officers, mm -hmm. foreign service officers, and uh, civil service officers uh, through their careers. And have you had the time yet with the administrator, or with Chris or others to think that through with our HCTM people? Because a number of us worked, for example, uh, at the National Defense University for AID for a couple years, and we saw how our military colleagues start that leadership grooming and investing from the very beginning for 20 years through their through their careers. Um, so that's one question. The other is FSNs. I think those of us who've practiced in the field, and you also were with State Department, we know that if we were to be honest with ourselves, our success is at least 50% responsible on the shoulders of and the capabilities of our FSNs, and they're two-thirds of our collective brains in AIT. So at the at the marginal cost, what are we thinking about doing to get even more bang out of our incredibly 
valuable FSNs, who many of whom at the professional level could go anywhere. Right. Thank you. That's great. Um, thank you. So let's. I do distinguish between um, foreign service officers and civil servants when it comes to training for a couple of reasons. And one of them is something that is unique to AID, very different from the State Department, which is that AID foreign service officers stay in the field forever. Uh, it's like coming they back can. here if they, yeah, if they can, um, which does limit an ability to build a cohesion and to build a, a, a network, uh, and, as well as to have relevant trainings um, that are significant and important for that very grooming. So the distinction I see is AID, you get promoted in the field, State Department, you get promoted out of Washington. So they're two very different groups of foreign service officers. And it's one of the reasons when people talk about should aid merge with uh, State Department, that it's really you're talking about, and people aren't talking about that, trust me. But every once in a while, it comes up. Uh, the response is you're talking about apples and oranges, and the way that aid does its work is very different. So in the field, I admit, I struggle with how we build those leadership capacities um, because I think so much of what we have to do for our leaders is to have them know each other. And we can do conferences that last a week here in Washington, which is what I've seen going on with all of the different variety of backstops. But that, to me, isn't enough. Um, and what we're trying to encourage is for people to come to Washington so that they don't end up 28, 32 years out in the field and suddenly being forced to serve their first Washington, D.C. tour at a very senior level in the agency, and they don't know how the agency works. So that's one thing that we think about in terms of foreign service is trying to find meaningful FS2, uh, FS1 positions uh, that aren't necessarily stretch positions, but that are at grade, that offer a great opportunity for the Foreign Service to build a cohort uh, to work together and to know as well how to operate in Washington, D.C. with their civil servant counterparts. I think the opportunities for training for civil servants by virtue of them all being located in more or less the same place is that we have opportunities to develop good leadership skills training. I think what's been done, as far as I can tell to date, Jim, and I haven't delved deeply, but I think what's been done has been on, a, on an almost ad hoc basis uh, and hasn't been well institutionalized. And so that's something that also, frankly, uh, HCTM is so focused on getting these transformation pieces put together uh, that adding something new to their plate is something that derails uh, something else. And so that's on the menu of things that'll be added. But right now, it seems to be proceeding more or less on ad hoc basis in the civil service. In terms of FSNs, well, it, nothing could be more true. Uh, we are dependent on the FSN and third country national communities in our missions overseas more than we're dependent on really anyone because they're the institutional memory. And there are, I know we have an active FSN leadership community that uh, gets together regularly, whether in person or in conference calls, and discusses, well, whither the FSN service uh, and what should be done, what can be done as well about getting us promoted above certain levels. If I say a number, I'm sure I'll get it wrong, so I'm not going to throw out a number. Um, but I think it's really important um, for them to have that channel. They very often, that's channeled through the counselor. Uh, and Chris does, as you all know, and as Tom did before him and Susan before him, 
uh, a great job of raising FSN issues and FSN profile to whoever the administrator is. It's something that we can't take for granted. I think neither Mark nor I take FSNs for granted because we both needed them when we served overseas. But that's not always going to be the case in a front office. So it remains incumbent on the counselor, whoever that person is historically, to be the one who raises that profile level as well as raises with the M Bureau the important management concerns that come out of the FSN committee. So I hope that answers your questions. Okay, I think this will probably be the last one. Yes, please. Yes, hi, I'm uh, David Adams, uh, last in the PPC Bureau, and then I was USAID Haiti Mission Director before that. Um, recently, Administrator Green rolled out the uh, revamped new version of the, new, the former new partner initiative that had been originally uh, <clears throat> limited, shall we say, to uh, PEPFAR back in the waning uh, days of the, of the uh, Bush 43 administration. And then, I, um, as I understand it, the new version is and, and will encompass a number of sectors. Uh, it seems that the, in the initial phase or phases of it, however, um, the, that it's been limited to only certain sectors and certain countries, like Iraq, I think, mm -hmm. for example. So my question to you is, what, what's the vision here? Where, where do you see this going? and how broadly will it be applied? Is it still kind of similar as to the last one regarding uh, the primary uh, community it's aimed at uh, to implement the programs, our, our faith-based organizations, as well as uh, other, a variety of other NGOs? That's a great question. And I want to talk about the new partnerships initiative a little bit differently than what I understand has been communicated out. One of the things that I've heard is that uh, when we at AID have been talking about the new partnerships initiative, it's almost been uh, in a way that denigrates our traditional partners, and nothing could be further from the truth. We cannot, we cannot say to our traditional uh, uh, grant recipients and contractors that they're because they're so good at their jobs, uh, we are making changes to take that away. We have stellar implementing partners in the form of the NGO community and the contracting community. You all know, certainly better than I do, that we could not exist without them. We would not be able to operationalize our work. So first, I'm grateful to our implementing partners, and I think we don't say that enough. Um, the idea behind the new partnerships initiative is that that being said, it's okay to bring new people to the table. It's also okay to lower the barriers to entry for USAID work. There are a lot of people out there, and they are absolutely not limited to the faith-based community, who are interested in the good work that we do at USAID and who have brilliant ideas of how to do it. They don't all come from the United States. They certainly don't all come from inside the Beltway, and they are certainly intimidated by some of these massive RFP responses that we, res that we expect. And so how do you then say to some of those people, we value your good idea if we then don't have any way in the world of implementing their good idea? So NPI is starting out uh, pilotish uh, in a, at a smaller scale. Uh, it did start in northern Iraq with an eye toward uh, protecting and promoting religious and ethnic minorities, as well as the return of refugees and IDPs to their traditional homes in Christian and Yazidi communities. The idea behind that NPI work is that it would be focused on local entities in Iraq. So they might have American arms, but the idea is for this to be local solutions for the very local uh, problem. 
implemented by people who are most familiar with how to get people able to return to their traditional homes. So each rollout of NPI will probably have a slightly different flavor, uh, but the idea of all of it is to find ways to bring new players into the aid pool, not to limit the work that's being done by our traditional partners. To that end, in fact, one of the components of NPI is a mentoring program, wherein we're asking our traditional implementing partners, whether they're NGOs or contractors, to team up with smaller businesses, smaller NGOs, and mentor them. And we'll set aside portions of funding that will go to those, you know, big brother, big sister model to help those uh, less well-formed, well-established NGOs and companies build up their qualifications and their expertise. It just helps us overall in terms of having more arms and legs on the ground to implement USAID projects beyond uh, what we currently do and beyond what our current expectations are. But lowering barriers to entry is the fundamental aspect of it, and then guaranteeing success of new partners by having them paired up with existing partners, longstanding partners of USAID. So I hope that answers some of your questions. It's delightful to be here. I'm sorry I'm rushed, but thank you for being here. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you so much for your presence. And for the counselor accompanying you as bodyguard. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> OK, let's just move right along here. Um, we move on to the session that will call for audience participation uh, in terms of applause. Uh, first, I would like to go through the thank yous for the board members who are standing down. That would be George Hill, Terry Myers, and Franklin Moore. Round of applause, please. We're not letting you get away, however. Don't forget, Franklin, you've promised to keep working. Okay, now the board results, the board election results. First off, we're very pleased with the number of individuals who voted again this year. It's very important for us to get confirmation of the slate that, that the board does put forward. I'm very pleased to announce our new board members are, and if you would stand, please, Jim Beaver. <laughs> to whom I refer as the Energizer Bunny, so we're going to get a lot done this coming year. Carol Dabbs, and Margaret Noise, who unfortunately was not able to be with us. She's, I think, on a holiday in Australia. So we consider that a reasonable excuse. OK, this group will be joining um, the four, two continuing board members, Ann Arnes and Terry Brown. If you'd like to stand, please. And Chris Crowley and I have gotten vote of confidence, thank you very much, to continue for another two years. This group, please, 430 for photograph, out back. Next, and this is always a very popular item on the agenda as well, and that is the annual alumni awards. So I completely turn the floor over to Betty Cook. Is she here? Good. Hello again. Um, as the chair of the awards committee, thanks to Mr. Amager, Ambassador Amager, I'm sorry, um, I have the honor of announcing the winners of the 2019 uh, Alumni of the Year Awards. 
Um, every year since its inception, about five years ago, the uh, UAA has recognized and celebrated alumni who have, you say alumni, who have chosen paths that serve their communities and contribute to others, both abroad and in this country. We have, um, this year's winners, of course, are, uh, they'll get a handsome um, world table clock by Howard Miller, and it will have an engraving with their name and their, uh, the type of award that's being given them. But before I get into telling you who they are, just wanna make sure the pictures don't get ahead of me. Uh, before I tell you who they are, I'd like to give some credit to the others serving on this awards committee that have done so well, that give thought and time to this effort to select these winners. And even though we get very challenging number of excellent awardees, they come or they rise to the occasion and pick really excellent winners. And let me just mention their names. And if you don't mind just standing so people will know who you are. I know Larry Garber left. He apologized. He wasn't going to be here to get his accolades. Um, Tom DeCastro, are you here? Back in the corner. OK. <laughs> Margaret Healy is not here, I know. And Carol Peasley, right up front. And Nancy Pillmeyer, again, right here at the front. And Elzadia Washington, who's also not here. I don't notice you know a, a trend going on here. You hear the same name stepping up and doing a lot of things with this organization. And I would just want to tell you, you're all invited to join us. It's fun and good comrades. So think of doing some of these things. We'll welcome you on the awards committee, too, by the way. Okay, and then our equally important is I want to thank those who nominate these uh, awardees for selection. Um, it, it takes a lot of their time and energy and thought, and we do appreciate that. And, and I'll put my ad up front this time because I do it in the end and nobody pays attention. If you, throughout the year, if you have people that you know and you want to nominate, please do so. We welcome them. We also do profiles in the newsletter and the web uh, site. And if you have suggestions for people you, in your community that you like, uh, UAA members, by the way, uh, let me know. Um, let any of us know, and we'll consider them for profiles. We like to recognize those of you who are doing good work, and most of you are, we know. So just keep in mind we're open and, and get back to us. Um, I want to make one exception for this year's awardees, too. In, in previous years, traditionally, we try to pick two winners, one for international service and one for domestic service. This year, our two winners were equally, uh, it was very difficult. They, they both do really good things, both at home and abroad. And we ultimately redecided that we were going to give these two winners. And by the way, they were equally uh, the winners, so we couldn't pick one over the other. They were both too good. Uh, and we're giving awards to each of them for both international and domestic service this year. Okay, I think the first one um, is, no, oh, I have to figure this out. Okay, could I ask our two winners of the Alumni of the Year, Mary Lou Ellen? Mary, you didn't leave. You've been here all day. Come on. Where is Mary? Oh, here we are. <laughs> You want to come up to the stage and sit with me? Uh, Ted Morris, her husband, maybe you'd like to come down front, too, so we can see you. You don't want to? Okay. All right. Mary, please join me on stage. Larry Heilman. Okay. Uh, okay. While Larry's joining us, I'm going to just highlight a few things about, we're starting with Mary. I'm going to highlight a few things about her, but I encourage you to read her profile in the November newsletter or go on to the website to read it because I, her accomplishments are just too, well, both of their accomplishments are too many, and they never give me enough time. So I'm going to just highlight a few, and I'm going to read them. And I came with my glasses, so here we go. 
For over 42 years, Mary has repeatedly demonstrated a keen interest and high level of competence in all aspects of international development and foreign policy during her 26-year USAID career from 1977 to 2003 and during her 16-year retirement to date. While serving as USAID director in Ethiopia, she faced serious medical challenges, but neither cancer surgery followed by chemo and a detached retina have slowed her down. Since retirement, Mary has continued to serve actively in several major ways. First, Mary has excelled in academic service. For the past 14 years, she has taught college classes at Sierra Nevada College. She is chairperson of the International Studies and International Business, and she guest lectures in international development and interdiscipline studies. Her students say she motivates, inspires with her international lessons learned from serving abroad with USAID. The college students voted her the outstanding faculty member in 2015. The college allows her husband, Ted, who is also a USAID alumni, as we all know, um, he substitutes for Mary's classes so she can continue to serve abroad. Uh, second, Mary has organized annual student services and learning trips to Africa. For the last seven years, she has done the year-long planning with African partners to organize and lead 25 to 30 American college students to do service and learning for three weeks in the rural areas of South Africa. The students cover their own expenses, but Mary invariably donates funds or frequent flyer miles to enable underprivileged students to make the trips and serve by helping expand and renovate schools, an HIV clinic, and schools and community vegetable gardens. Mary personally provides funds for hundreds of children's books, suitcases full of school supplies, and cash for renovation supplies every year. Mary and Ted donated funds to rebuild sports facilities. It's interesting, Mary, how we rope our husbands in on these, isn't it? His money's mine, too. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. Mary has also structured college uh, classes in South Africa for American students at the Sierra Nevada College. The students receive academic credit while simultaneously doing their daily work and service schedules and participating in an, Africa, an African culture uh, program put on by a local troop. Unfailingly, the American students return to the U.S. openly stating, this is a life-changing experience. And lastly, I note that every year since retirement from USAID, Mary has continued to serve in USAID and to train and mentor USAID staff around the world. She has been contracted to serve in various senior positions in Southern Africa. As of this year, she completed her 17th training assignment in Afghanistan, and, as August, and in August, she provided training in USAID, Thailand, and Kabul. Um, the importance of training to help the U.S. government, quote, improve its ability to pre prepare for, design, execute, monitor, and evaluate stabilization missions, end quote, in Afghanistan was stressed in the May 2018 report by the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction. I think we call that SIGAR. Um, Mary's service and training have greatly supported this effort. Mary is granted the UAA Alumna of the Year Award for 2019 based on her many years of continuous dedicated service and personal donations to U.S. students and overseas schools and communities. A true inspiration to us all. Congratulations, Mary. First, to my husband, thank you for all of his support. Without that, I wouldn't be able to do what I have been doing. And I think for all of us, AID was a passion. So when my husband says, when are you going to retire, I keep saying, but I'm not working. I'm doing what I love doing. And I think all of us are doing that. So to all of my colleagues here, thank you, one and all. It was an inspiration and a, a joy to work with all of you during our time at USAID, and I hope that we can continue working together for as long as we are all around. So thank you to the Alumni Association for this award, but I know this award 
could be taken by each and every one of you because all of you contribute each and every day to the service. Thank you. Um, okay, next on our agenda is Larry Heilman. Uh, it's really a, a pleasure for me to introduce Larry Heilman to all of you, too, and to know that he has been granted this Alumnus of the Year for 2019 in both domestic and international service. Larry, I'm going to highlight as well for you some of the things that you have been engaged in and encourage everyone to read his profile. Uh, throughout nearly 30 years of retirement, Larry has combined the same qualities of unrelented energy unrelenting energy, passion, and intellectual curiosity in promoting contributions to his community, which were manifest during his 30 years working in the international development area. The results have been impressive and include strengthening Rotary International programs around the world, improving local government in Chevy Chase Village, boosting Latin American studies and research at local universities and the Smithsonian, and working with wounded warriors at Walter Reed Hospital. Here are some highlights of Larry's contributions. First, with the Rotary International. Larry has been an active member of Rotary for the past 30 years, leading efforts to expand Rotary's programs in domestic and international community development and disaster assistance. As director of International Service uh, Lane, supporting 60 clubs in the Washington area, Larry provided training on the design, implementation, and monitoring of Rotary-funded projects. As president of the Friendship Heights Rotary Club, he led efforts to establish and manage a foundation providing community development grants. He also played a lead role in strengthening the foundation for other Rotary Clubs in the region that were interested in humanitarian assistance and development. His efforts through Rotary have had enormous impact in countries worldwide. In recognition of his work, Larry has received awards for leadership from three different Rotary Clubs. Metro Bethesda, Friendship Heights Bethesda, and San Pedro Sula, Honduras. Second, for the Chevy Chase Village Land Government, in a multiplicity of roles, included elected member of the Board of Managers, Chair of the Personnel Committee, Treasurer, member of the Budget Committee, member of the Audit Committee, Chair of the Public Safety and Energy and Environment Committees, and leader of the Good Governance and Dem Democratic Practice Initiative. In these roles, Larry has been able to promote broader participation of village residents in their government. A notable achievement has been in development of a village resident-managed and transparent election process for leadership of the Board of Managers, which continues today. Third, in education, Larry has been a leader in Latin American studies, sharing his interest and experience in Latin America by teaching formal courses and giving lectures in history, archaeology, and culture at Montgomery College, Johns Hopkins, and University College, University of Maryland. When presenting the historical survey focused on Latin America history in the 20th century, he discussed the role of foreign assistance as it impacted the development of countries such as Bolivia, Chile, Cuba, Guatemala, and Mexico. For the last 17 years, Larry has taught pro bono a course at American University's uh, Osher Lifelong Learning Institute. Fourth, in research. For the past 20 years, uh, Larry has been a research associate in, in Andean archaeology within the anthropology department at the Smithsonian's Museum of Natural History. Larry's principal research has been a comprehensive history of USAID in Bolivia. And last year, after more than a decade of original research, USAID in Bolivia, partner or patron, it was published. Other research activities by Larry have involved field work in central India in the Yucatan. Recently, the Smithsonian's Anthropology Department has asked Larry to classify a collection of 300 non-prescient metal adornments for women given to the Anthropology Department by challenging me here. <laughs> Um, anthropology department by the Heilmans to eliminate the role that metallurgy played in the evolution of culture in West Africa. Lastly, and very noteworthy, Larry has been active with the Wounded Warriors NGOs for kayaking. 
diagnosed with melanoma and under treatment at Walter Reed Hospital as a Vietnam veteran. Larry joined the hospital's chapter of the Wounded Warrior NGO, composed of veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan. Most of the servicemen were more than 50 years, I shouldn't have said that, 50 years Larry's <laughs> senior. But undeterred, Larry became a regular member of the hospital's kayak football team, organized to give the wounded warriors who had lost legs or eyesight in combat an opportunity to regain a sense of control by navigating the challenging waters of the Potomac. Larry's organizational talents helped the program to raise funds and assist in program administration while he continued to put, participate fully in their activities. More recently, Larry has encouraged the program efforts to reach out to wounded warriors suffering from post-traumatic stress, a PTSD, as you may know, uh, that continues to result in an unconscionable rate of suicide and of returned veterans. So Larry, we're pleased to award you this alumnus of the year. Award. My experience as a civilian working in my community, internationally, etc., reaches back to AID and all the things I learned working in democracy programs, community development programs. Uh, and if it had been for the rich experience I had, I probably couldn't have done the things I've done the last 20 years. Betty has enumerated them, so there's no reason for me to repeat that. But frankly, they all reflect the kind of things I learned in working with aid. I want to make one correction. It's my wife that's going to be doing the uh, analysis at, uh, 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 at the Smithsonian in the Department of Anthropology. I thought it was going to be me, but when we look back on the, on the history of, the, of, of our work there, it was clearly uh, that Anne was the one that was going to be doing that. And as a matter of fact, when they talked to us about doing it and extending my appointment there, they made it very clear they really didn't want me. They wanted Anne. <laughs> so I, but what I, I, I should also emphasize, emphasize that obviously uh, a part of all these activities has been the support of my wife. As a matter of fact, recently I had a, a long talk with my oncologist trying to sort out why I was successful. And I was really one of the early successors in this whole area of immune therapy. And we concluded it was for three reasons. Good science, a lot of friends, and a devoted wife. And that's what caused me to sort of come back and flourish. I want to close with just a, a quote, hope I can read it, uh, that reflects how I feel, and a lot of you guys feel too. I arise in the morning torn between a desire to improve the world and a desire to enjoy the world. This makes it a hard pl it this makes it hard to plan the day. <laughs> Evie Wright. Thank you, Larry and Mary. They really are an inspiration to us all, and I think they continue the ideals and principles that we've all learned at USAID if we didn't go in there, and that we've brought out with us, and we're very happy to have you as our UAA Alumni of the Year 2019. Thank you for your service. You want this? Betty. Come on, Betty. Come on. Should we put the rose between two thorns? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank all of you. Chris, Nancy. So I have no clue what's going to happen next. Um, <laughs> okay. So 
I'm going to introduce Barbara Seligman and Nancy Peelmeyer. Um, and um, I'd like to give a huge thank you to Nancy Peelmeyer and Joy Riggs Perla for leading the AGM committee in organizing this excellent meeting. Uh, they're going to have a few a few closing comments. Um, would you like to come on up here and? Um, one last public service announcement, even though the group has diminished. Steve Silcox evidently earlier today dropped his money clip, including his um, driver's license. So if anyone sees it, please just return it to me. I'll get it to him. Well, thank you all for coming. We think that's somewhat of an evaluation of uh, the fact that the AGM is important to all of us as members. Um, and, but we would also like to call on you to remind you to fill out the evaluation, which you will be receiving electronically within the next few days. So please do give us your response. It's going to be pretty open-ended, and we want you to give us your ideas, your thoughts, your reactions um, so that we can continue to improve this meeting. Um, I'd like to just say a special word of thanks to our fearless leaders, Nancy and Chris, for um, a really good year. And we look forward to having you continue um, as um, on the board and all of this, uh, the new crew. Um, thank you to all of the board members. Um, and to the executive committee, uh, which is made up of the board and committee chairs, to all of the committee members and all other volunteers for what you do every day to bring UAA to life. A special thanks to Terry Myers for his most recent intervention that has really, I think, galvanized us all. And thank you to our panelists and speakers today, and uh, especially to the Deputy Administrator. Joy. Okay, well, my thanks again to everyone who attended and participated so actively in this meeting. It was great to see that. And let me just say one more time, we really welcome volunteers. This was my first year to get involved, and it really is fun. There's a lot of camaraderie, and it's great. So please join us if you can. And then in order to reach our uh, goals for expanded membership, please look around you and think about the friends you see that are not here and the people that you could help us recruit so that we have even a, a larger UAA for next year. So again, thank you and great to see everyone. <laughs>